So um, just for the record, uh, we've got uh, the, the community board traffic and transportation committee will uh, come to order. Uh, we have uh, Mary Ellen, uh, Kelly, David Gelman, Chris Calhoun, Georgia, and Ed Green all in attendance. So we have a quorum. Um, and we are just waiting for Isvali Jimenez as well to, to sign in, which I, I uh, have no reason to believe he's not coming. Um, um, so I would just like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, I have a few housekeeping items uh, to acquaint anyone who isn't familiar with uh, our format. Um, so as a community board committee, we loosely follow Robert's rules of order. We will go in the order of the amended agenda that was previously distributed. If you open a topic, or if we open a topic to um, general, dis general discussion, we ask that if you would like to speak, that you raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, our goal is to have a good, robust discussion of our agenda items. And to that end, if we have a lot of people speaking um, any, on any individual topic, you may only get to speak once. So make sure to make it count. Um, we also ask that if you speak, just uh, as a matter of form, direct your comments to me, the chair, or to the presenter, um, or to the group as a whole, just so that nobody, no one individual feels attacked. And if you're not speaking, we ask that you keep yourself muted to prevent background noise from interrupting others. So um, if you're on Zoom, to raise your hand, you will select reactions at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you change your name in Zoom to your actual name, it'll assist us if we need to enter it into the minutes or to call on you. Um, public participants though are not required to give their names in order to participate in the discussion. It is just simply a courtesy. If you're on the phone, star six to mute and unmute, and then star nine to raise your hand or to lower your hand. Um, so tonight we expect to have a lot of people who would like to comment on the Riverdale Avenue proposal. So we ask that everyone keep their comments to two minutes or less, but we're gonna try to make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, so I started already with attendance of the committee members. Are there any um, community board members? And just I'll say that I already have a, I saw Sylvia, you're here. Uh, Rob Jaklowski, uh, Laura Spalter, Bob Bender, Chuck Mordler, Lisa Dial. Is there anybody else? Oh, and Rob Spalter. I'm already here, here, okay. Anybody else? Can we get another chair, honey? Mm -mm. No? Okay. Nick Fazio. Oh, Nick, you're here, okay. All right, any other board members? I can't see everybody's names, there's a lot of them, so, um, okay. All right, very good. Are there any elected officials? I saw that um, Assembly Mendenowitz is here. Yes, I'm uh, here. Great, and I see Frederick, you're here as well. Yes, thank you. Is Enzo here? Oh yeah, is uh, the Council Mendenowitz here yet? Not yet, okay. I see Randy, Debbie. Oh, Randy. Uh, Randy Matos. Yep. I see Rosemary. Thank Ginty. you. Okay, so we have Randy and then Rosemary Ginty. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I see the assemblyman or the councilman is signing in right now. And Rosemary. Okay. All right. And then um, from the agencies, I believe I saw uh, Keith Taub, Holly Malone, and Darissa. Anybody else? Hey, uh, it's Keith Kalb. How are you? Hey there. Uh, yes, we have Darissa Cruz, our senior borough planner with us. We also have Holly Malone, our Green Wave coordinator attending. We have Chris Brunson, who's our director of safety projects and uh, programs at our research implementation and safety division. Could We're you spell, I'm sorry, could you spell their last name? Brunson, B-R-U-N-S-O-N. Great, thank you. And Chris with a C? Correct. Okay. We're also joined by Alicia Posner, who's our deputy director, the same unit. Uh, Alicia, last name is P-O-S-N-E-R. Okay. 
Alicia, I believe, is a common spelling, A-L-I-C-I-A. Okay. Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong. Got it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you for having us tonight. We really appreciate it. We look uh, forward to showing you uh, the safety improvement project that we have uh, been working on uh, for Riverdale Avenue between two, West 254 and West 262nd Street. I'm gonna um, turn. So, so wait, Keith, can I stop you one second? Let me let me just finish. I was just doing oh, the sorry. attendance. Sorry, go ahead. I, I know you're eager. <laughs> this has been a, <laughs> a long day, I'm sure. Um, is there any any other, are there any other board members or any other elected officials? Okay, great. Uh, I'm an elected official. Hey Hello, there. It's Eric Dinowitz. How are you? I've got you down. I saw you signing in. So welcome. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, so the first item on the agenda, so the, the first item is that um, the, according to the agenda, we'd be doing our approval of minutes first. Um, we have a couple of uh, details we need to tweak with the minutes. So I move to move adjust the agenda to just put the minutes um, after we do our budget items at the end so that we can do that when um, it's a little bit, uh, I don't think you're all here to uh, see the edits for the minutes. Um, do I have any, um, is there anybody on the committee who's opposed to that? No. Okay. All right, great. So for the chair's report, I'm just, I don't have anything really to report to tonight. I would just like to skip to the, the first item on the agenda, which is the DOT presentation of safety improvements uh, on Riverdale Avenue. So the first item is a presentation from the Bronx Department of Transportation on safety improvements on Riverdale Avenue between West 254th Street and the city line. And before they get started with the presentation, there's a little bit of history to this that might be helpful to provide some context for folks who weren't following this issue back in 2017. So I went back to the original minutes and kind of pulled up, um, or the original committee minutes just to pull up uh, that context in case it's helpful since so many folks have been referencing it. Um, so this matter was first brought to this committee on October 17, 2017, when the North Riverdale Merchants Association, which is now called the Riverdale Main Street Alliance, made a presentation of their streetscape report. Um, at that time, um, Assembly, Mem Assembly Member Jeffrey Dinowitz and State Senator Jeff Klein sent a letter to DOT asking them to not proceed with this plan. Um, later at the November 30th, 2017 uh, Traffic and Transportation Committee meeting, um, the committee passed a resolution, this committee, um, although with different folks on it, um, passed a resolution supporting the following Riverdale Avenue recommendations, uh, supporting beautification efforts, repaving, repair sidewalks, installation of state-of-the-art traffic signal controllers, and a left-hand turn signal at West 256th Street and Riverdale Avenue. Um, however, uh, in the same resolution, the committee was opposed to the reduction of lanes on Riverdale Avenue and signage to prohibit truck access on West 259th Street between Riverdale Avenue and Broadway. Um, so that's kind of the history here. The other thing that I think it's important to say before Keith gets started is that Vision Zero, which is the program, which is the basis of this design, I believe, has essentially become kind of the national standard for traffic safety in our country because it's been applied in so many places over the last decade and has reduced traffic deaths and injuries in those places. So our mayor, Eric Adams, ran on this commitment to reducing the risk to pedestrians, drivers, and bicyclists, especially for pedestrians and bicyclists at intersections. And we just had a press announcement um, about this um, just recently. Um, to this end, the mayor appointed Yadonis Rodriguez as his DOT commissioner for the whole city, who has been a strong advocate for Vision Zero improvements when he was on the city council. And the new DOT street plan has improvements like this already in the works um, throughout the whole city. So in addition to the thousands of Vision Zero safety projects, large and small, that have already been completed um, throughout the de Blasio administration. So in, in the past, um, when we've discussed anything um, involving safety improvements like this, and particularly involving bike lanes, we had this tendency to assume that the treatments that are being presented are experimental or have never been done before. And we have, for better or for worse, and mostly and I think it's not represented us well, we've attacked the competency of the borough commissioner or the engineers. And I think we can do better here tonight. And so um, I just invite us all to just listen to the details, listen to each other, and we can agree or disagree. Um, and I think we can have a really good um, discussion grounded in facts. 
Um, so with that, I see the floor to Keith Kalb and his team to give this presentation to us. De Deb, thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I don't have much more to say other than, uh, you know, thank you for having us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia, who's gonna run us through the presentation. You did an excellent job introducing us, uh, Deborah. Uh, so I'm just gonna turn it over to Alicia and show the presentation, because I know lots of folks are eager and have lots of questions. And we wanna explain to you what our rationale is for this wonderful safety improvement along Riverdale Avenue. Can we allow Alicia the yeah, ability yeah. to share? So you should be able to see my screen, the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, again, thank you all for having us here this evening. My name is Alicia Posner. I'm the Deputy Director of Safety Projects and Programs at DOT. And I'm here tonight to present our proposal for Riverdale Avenue between West 254th Street and West 263rd Street. So I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with the project limits. Um, the limits are between West 254th Street and West 263rd Street. The area has both residential and commercial land use. Um, quite a lot of uh, bus lines run on the corridor uh, north-south. The area has a very high concentration of schools. So there are a lot of school-aged children traversing the corridor, crossing back and forth on Riverdale Avenue. And there are also a lot of senior facilities located within the area. Um, so se and seniors, as we know, are tend to have slower walking speeds or more likely to have some sort of physical impairment, which tends to make them vulnerable user users when we're talking about traffic crashes. And they're actually overrepresented um, in that data. So we are the safety group at DOT. We work on Vision Zero safety improvement projects. So when we look at a corridor for a study, the first thing we do is we go to the data and look at the NYPD crash data for the area. So you can see a sampling of that here between 2015 and 2019. There were 66 total injuries on the corridor and 26 of those involved a pedestrian. Unfortunately, uh, there were two senior pedestrian uh, fatalities on Riverdale Avenue in recent years, one at West 258th Street in 2015 and one at West 263rd Street in 2018. There was also a motor vehicle fatality at West 256th Street in 2018. So we don't just look at the data, we like to the actual numbers, we like to dig down a little bit more um, and see what are the causes of these crashes, what are the behaviors and the conditions that are leading to these crashes. So when we look at that, we can see that over half of pedestrian crashes occurred while a pedestrian was crossing with the signal in their favor. Also nearly 60% of pedestrian crashes occurred while a driver was making a left turn. So if you put those two together, you can kind of get a picture of what's going on. A pedestrian is crossing Riverdale Avenue or one of the cross streets with the walk signal in their favor and a car is making a turn and fails to yield to the pedestrian and strikes them. Looking at motor vehicle crashes, we can see that uh, over a third of those injuries to motor vehicle occupants are caused by rear end collisions, which tends to be indicative of speeding. The existing conditions of the corridor itself, it's a 60 foot ride, uh, roadway with two travel lanes and parking in both directions. And the lanes themselves don't have lane designations. There are long crossing distances throughout the corridor, especially for school aged children and for seniors who have less visibility and slower walking speeds. 
We do see double parking on the corridor, especially in the commercial areas. Um, and in those areas, the roadway is reduced to one effective through lane because vehicles are needing to move into the center uh, shared through left lane in order to get around the double parked vehicles. So this can lead to some unpredictable uh, vehicle maneuvers, unpredictable behavior. You can see here in the bottom slide, a vehicle, uh, this vehicle is waiting to turn left. I, I think you can see my cursor. This vehicle is stuck behind them trying to go through. And this vehicle on the other side is actually making a right turn from the uh, leftmost lane, from the shared uh, through left lane. You can see uh, there how the unmarked vehicle lanes combined with the double parking, the shared left through lane, uh, with the vehicles going through, waiting behind the left turning vehicles, just causes a number of issues for motor vehicle uh, users. And you can see kind of a picture there of how when we take all those things together, um, the looking for pedestrians and yielding to pedestrians when drivers are navigating all those things is often the last thing they're thinking about and can lead to these crashes. So we've received a number of requests for improvements over the years, um, including most recently from the Riverdale Main Streets Alliance and State Senator Biagi's office. Um, and we think that there's excess road capacity and low volumes, which uh, result in an open road that's conducive to speeding and also those unpredictable vehicle movements that we talked about before. You can see the traffic volumes there for your reference. So taking all these things together, the crashes, the existing conditions, we look at the roadway and we come up with a proposal that we think will address and reduce those crashes while maintaining mobility um, for all modes. And so you can see here our proposal, it's we're changing the roadway uh, from two moving lanes in each direction, which are have no lane designations to one lane in each direction with a, a flush median and left turn bays, a five foot bike lane marked in each direction and a nine foot parking lane. And I'm just gonna talk through that proposal a little bit more in the next few slides. So this is a treatment that has actually been used all throughout New York City and in the Bronx in particular. Um, similar projects noted here have resulted in significant reductions uh, in injuries, as well as speeding. Um, it, we've had about a 50 to 20% drop in injuries on similar projects that were installed in the Bronx in recent years. I'm sure you all are interested in uh, the <laughs> traffic volumes as well. Um, so we do robust data collection and observation through video, in person. Um, we use traffic modeling software um, to make sure, in consultation with engineers, to make sure everything is feasible. But just to give you a sense, uh, we think a congested lane is about 700 vehicles an hour, you know, give or take the conditions. Um, and even with the proposal and the volumes on Riverdale Avenue, we're going to be well below capacity with the max um, vehicle volume. And here's just another view of the proposal. This is a similar configuration that's been implemented in recent years on Morris Park Avenue in the Bronx. And you can see we have the standard with travel lanes, which are defined um, to discourage speeding. You have the left turn lane in the center. So those left turning vehicles don't have to share with the vehicles going through. They're able to move into their own lane. They can wait before making their left turn. So they have visibility from the opposing traffic and they only have to yield to one lane of oncoming traffic instead of two in the existing conditions where they may not be sure where people are going, are they going through, turning left, turning right. 
um, and they can wait to safely make their turn and they can see pedestrians in the crosswalk more easily with less things to negotiate. Um, you also have a defined parking lane, which will help discourage double parking, a five foot bike lane, which just helps cyclists who may be using the corridor be uh, more visible uh, for all users. And this also just illustrates again how this design helps improve uh, safety and mobility for all users. You can see here in the existing conditions, we have vehicles who are turning left or going through, uh, the left turning vehicles marked in red, the through vehicles in blue. In the existing conditions, you have the shared through left lane. Vehicles are often using that, especially if there are double uh, parked vehicles approaching the intersection. And so the vehicles turning left are kind of waiting in the intersection. They're blocking the vehicles going through. They're having to navigate to oncoming lanes of traffic. Um, and then also the last thing they're looking for then is cyclists or pedestrians who may be using the crosswalk. In the proposed conditions, you have your left turn bay, you have your through lane, and you can also make rights uh, from that lane. And so the vehicles who are making their lefts are able to proceed into their lane, wait until they have a gap in on oncoming traffic, and are able to more easily navigate the intersection and yield to pedestrians. Um, and I just want to highlight the proposal does include a bike lane in both directions on Riverdale Avenue and the bike lane we believe will provide a safe and convenient uh, connection to existing uh, bike lanes in the network, as well as improve access to Van Cortland Park. So that's all I have for you just to go over the benefits. Uh, the project we believe will reduce speeding and calm traffic on Riverdale Avenue, enhance safety um, by providing defined spaces um, so everyone knows what they are in the roadway, vehicles and cyclists and pedestrians, safety for all users by encouraging slower, safer turns um, and create an uh, important new bike connection in the Bronx. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to the chair. Oh, thank you. Um, it's, it's, uh, you can stop sharing. Okay. Um, I'll, uh, then I'll be able to see a little bit better. Um, I think, let, all right, there we go. I had three people waiting in the waiting room. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so I'm, now I'm gonna open um, it over to uh, any electeds who have uh, any questions or anything they would like to say, and then we'll go to the committee for questions. I don't think, oh, I see uh, Councilman uh, Dinowitz, would you like to, uh, yeah. would you like to speak? Of course. Thanks, Deb. I want to make sure you can hear me through the mask, right? Yes. I, yes. Not too much. Okay. Um, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Council Member Eric Dinowitz. Glad to be here tonight uh, to discuss DOT's lane reduction plan for Riverdale Avenue. Um, I, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about what happened before tonight. Suffice it to say, I believe transparency is very important. Bringing people to the table is very important. If you want to read more on that, you can uh, check out the statement I and the assembly member posted on social media. And I think there was an article in the Riverdale Press about the things leading up to this process. Uh, but we are here tonight um, about this proposal. And I want to make clear for everybody from the DOT to the community board to the community members, everybody wants to be safe. Nobody should ever characterize one's position, mine, or any constituent as not interested in safety. Um, we, I met with the DOT on Monday, and there were a number of questions that I asked them. Uh, we're still waiting for follow-up, so I'm going to share some of those questions and comments. The first thing that I think is very important is that we have to clearly identify the, the problem. Um, 
if if the problem is that there is not a bike path, then and you want more bike paint, then that's then this is your answer. Then the Bronx DOT should just say that they want to do um, a painted bike path on Riverdale Avenue. Um, what's important to me is otherwise in terms of safety, identifying the problem, and that goes back to the data. So not just where the accidents occur, but at what time of day was the was the driver turning left? Were they turning right from what street were they turning? And the reason this is important is because I think, for example, um, 13 or 14 of the crashes occurred at 256th Street. Now you can, uh, they may want to pop that slide up again, um, but, but that's the place where we've been asking for a left turn arrow. We've been asking for right of way for drivers for that. So there is predictability for drivers uh, and for pedestrians. If the concern is turning speed, there are turning treatments that the DOT has in its toolbox that they can use. So if the problem is turning, there are left turn and right turn treatments that the DOT uh, has. If speed is the problem, um, it is my understanding that speed cameras were not explored, but also the data is true that when you install a speed camera, uh, people stop speeding. Uh, were speed cameras explored, were speed cushions um, explored, and speed cushions are essentially speed humps that don't impede on the ability of a bus to drive over. So they slow down cars, but they don't slow down buses. Um, I, I, again, we've been asking for more uh, specific data so we can actually address the problem, uh, the, the actual problem they're trying to solve. Uh, one of the other issues that was not yet answered is if you are coming north on the service road, service road, uh, Henderson Parkway up to 254th Street, you're in two lanes, um, and then it's going to go into one lane. As of now, there is no plan for how those um, how those lanes of traffic would merge. And the same is coming true. The same is true if you're coming from Yonkers, going southbound, two lanes of traffic into one. There is certainly no plan about how that merging uh, would occur. Um, I, I noticed in the presentation there was talking about double parking would be reduced. Um, the, I mean, I was on Morris Park Avenue two nights ago and there were cars double parked along the, the entire way. So um, I'm not judging your competency, just saying that the, exp you know, the experience is different than what your computer models may show you. Um, I, I, I do also wanna point out one other piece of information that's really important that I know the chair of the community board has brought up. Um, these lane narrowing and these lanes can't go any narrower because they're already uh at, like at their at their limit they're supposed to be prioritized specifically on corridors with safety or speed and concern um and so one of the important pieces of information is how safety at this corridor compares to other corridors throughout community board eight but the appropriate conditions for installation according to the doc website are you consider these where there are excessively wide lanes that doesn't exist. Um, it is supposed to be done, and this is according to the DOT's website, multi-lane corridors may be good candidates for lane removal in concert with other treatments, such as signal timing changes. I mentioned speed cushions. I mentioned turning treatments. Those were not discussed uh, in this in this proposal. Um, it, is, it is very important to get more robust data um, and explore options that will actually address the problem that is born out of out of that data. So um, I, I, I appreciate all of you who have emailed my office and shared your concerns uh, with me, both about the transparency of the DOT, both about the information they're sharing and about the, the plan itself, which many of us, uh, many of you saw for the first time tonight. Uh, I am looking forward to hearing what you all think about the plan and what comes out of this discussion. Um, and, and I hope I hope that for the Bronx DOT that this is actually a discussion that you actually hear what members of the community, whether they be business owners, parents at the school, uh, community residents, what they actually have to say and take and take in and actually listen to them. Um, because that has thus far not been my experience uh, with the Bronx DOT, but I hope we can change that going forward. Thank you, Deb. Right. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, so just to, to back up, I guess, to some of the questions that he raised um, with this, um, was there anything specifically when you're defining the specific problem here, 
what is the biggest thing you're you're looking at? Like, how would you define the problem here that this this treatment is addressing? Alicia, do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to answer that? Uh, sure, I can uh, answer that. So, the problem that were that was brought to us and why we uh, did a study here was uh, we had complaints about speeding and traffic crashes in the area. Um, we did a study. Um, we confirmed that those things that we saw were issues, and we analyzed the crashes and proposed um, a treatment which is proven um, to reduce uh, speeding and to reduce uh, crashes and crashes with injuries. Um, and so that was the point of our study. Um, I did quickly want to mention, and I uh, apologize for, I meant to mention this in the presentation and I omitted it, but I know Councilman Dinowitz did specifically request information about um, time of day of the crashes and um, a significant amount of those um, crashes did actually occur midday. Um, so about 50% of the crashes um, occurred between 9 a.m. in the morning and uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, which is actually much higher than the overall borough average um, which is about only 30% of those crashes happening during midday hours. Um, so just wanted to note that. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say just to address um, the council members um, questions and comments is that um, this proposal is definitely not, um, it is a proposal, but we are not uh, excluding the possibility in the future of some of the other things that were mentioned. Um, speed cushions um, are not uh, feasible according to our current engineering guidelines on four lane roadways, so two lanes in each direction, um, but we have installed them at other places uh, where you have uh, a similar configuration to what's being proposed. Um, left turn traffic calming does already exist um, on a few locations in the corridor and those would be uh, retained in the proposal. Um, and left turn signals um, have been studied in the past and found to be not feasible. Um, this proposal does not, um, does not prevent those from being installed in the future and I can let Keith speak to this, but um, perhaps they can be studied again in the future. Okay, great. We well, can you, certainly Gil. take a look at that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I guess next I will call on uh, Assemblyman uh, Jeffrey Denowitz. Jeffrey, you're still muted. Oh yes, Assemblyman, you're still muted. Sorry, I thought you'd do the unmuting. Um, thanks, Deb. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on the lack of transparency or the backroom discussions that took place. Let me focus on the issues. First, Vision Zero, sadly, in the past couple of years has, I mean, traffic fatalities and accidents have gone way up in the past few years. So I'm not sure Vision Zero has been great. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few points. One, I have been a staunch advocate of various safety improvements in my district for a very long time. Uh, because of my advocacy, we got left turn signals uh, at Van Cortland Avenue West and Orloff Avenue, at Tibbet Avenue and West 230th Street, at Riverdale Avenue and West 231st Street with a left turn only lane. I've also been, and I know not all of you might like this, but I've been a staunch advocate of speed cameras, of increasing the number of speed cameras and making it 24 seven because I believe those speed cameras work. And for the people who think it's, um, uh, you know, it's a money maker, I mean, we, you just have to go within the speed limit and none, none of us are perfect, obviously. But I've, I've really focused on all those safety measures. And I think it's very important. So I'm glad we're talking about safety issues on, on, our, on Riverdale Avenue. Now, the left turn signals here, I have advocated for a left turn signal for a pretty long time now at West 256th and 
uh, Riverdale Avenue going northbound to make a left turn to go westbound. Uh, it was just said that it's not feasible. I'm not sure why it's not feasible. We have a left turn signal at West 254th Street and Riverdale Avenue. That one was feasible, maybe because of, of politics. I don't know. And it was a good thing was put there. Um, West 256th Street, you have cars making the left turn to go into River to Netherland Gardens, to Riverdale Gardens, to Skyview, uh, to the Riverdale Y, among other things. Hundreds and hundreds of cars. A left turn signal with a left turn only lane would be amazing at that location. And yet, for whatever reason, DOT has consistently rejected, perhaps because they want to do this thing instead of that. Uh, I've, I've also asked for a left turn signal at West 259th Street uh, and Riverdale Avenue, again, going northbound. Uh, cars going into Skyview and cars going into SAR. Now, when you talk about a left turn lane in the middle, I'm not sure what good a left turn lane will be for the southbound traffic, because if you go there, and I assume some of you from Bronx DOT have been there at some point, um, there are very few cars making a left turn for the southbound traffic because Riverdale Avenue is just uh, a conduit uh, between Yonkers and the Henry Hudson Parkway. Left turns are made primarily by people going northbound. Now, there are some left turns for the southbound traffic, but far and, uh, and few between. Was that few and far between? Yes. Um, the point being that giving us a left turn lane is like giving us ice in the winter. We don't need it because it's just not uh, that useful. Uh, bike lanes, I happen to like bike lanes. I supported the bike lanes on Broadway. I know some of you were angry at me for doing it, but I thought that was a good idea. Um, and I don't have an issue with bike lanes as such here. I assume that's not the main motivation uh, to do this. But to me, the the issue, uh, according to you anyway, is, is safety. Um, 60 foot wide street, you mentioned that, but you didn't mention, maybe you did, that the street is gonna still be 60 feet wide. So nothing is gonna change. But simple math to me is that when you combine all the traffic from two lanes, into one lane, you're gonna have more traffic, cars are gonna be stuck, you have five bus lines, and especially for the southbound traffic where you have the largest share of the traffic, both in the AM and the PM, uh, I think you're gonna cause big problems. And let's remember, you talked about uh, double parking in the shopping area. I think the worst double parking is in front of PS81. If you go there in the morning during drop-off or in the afternoon during pickup. It is a disaster over there. Uh, if you go northbound on Riverdale Avenue to go stay to Skyview, which I do, um, you might have to wait for three cycles of the light just to make your turn because you've refused to do the left turn signal. And combining the traffic lanes is not going to help that. In fact, it's going to make it worse because you're going to still have double parking. And yes, you're going to have triple parking as you do now. So it seems to me that while I know your efforts are sincere in trying to improve safety, I think what you're going to do is make safety worse. You're going to make traffic worse and it's going to cause more confusion. And when traffic is worse, when people are getting upset that they're waiting in line, that's when people do stupid things when they drive. And that's what endangers people. So I don't think that uh, what you're suggesting at this point makes sense. What I would strongly recommend is do the two left turn signals that I mentioned, then do a study and see if it's made improvements before you go ahead and do a wholesale change of all of Riverdale Avenue from West 254th Street to 263rd Street. I realize that you like cheaper options of slapping paint on the street rather than doing something real, uh, which is what the left turn signals would be doing. But I'm just asking you, don't be doctrinaire, be open-minded with the community listen to what people, and I don't know what people are gonna to say tonight, but I imagine that the people who live in the area are probably going to not be totally supportive of this to say the least. Look at the idea of the left turn signals and do it before you go ahead and do all this stuff with the paint. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Assemblyman. Um, he does raise a really good point, which is when you're putting all the traffic into one lane, it's going to be harder to make a left-hand turn. Is there a compromise where these new bays would allow for the the turn signals that he's requesting? I mean, what what's the criteria that made them not feasible before, and would this improve their feasibility if you change this structure? If we convert the roadway to uh, from four to three lanes, it increases the likelihood that left turn signals would be feasible at these intersections. 
So that's something that we could so, request, correct? Certainly, but it would have to be converted first and then we would do the study, yes. No, you, you should do it the other way around. Don't be so stubborn on that. Do the left turn signals, see if it works and then consider what you're doing, but try the left turn signals first. It's it like, as they were already denied most of the intersections that were requested, they were denied because they didn't work under the current configuration. If the left turn bays are installed, it's more likely to meet the warrants. You could have left turn only lanes at those two intersections and do exactly what you're talking about uh, without going through this wholesale change on the street. Try it. Yeah. Try it. Uh, assembly member, you're correct. We could do that, but in order to have a left turn lane, we have to take a travel lane. No, well, you, you have left turn only lanes on Riverdale Avenue and West 231st Street. The left turn becomes a left turn only lane. And, it's a, and, it's a, and the, the other lane is just a through lane. Yeah. So uh, just, to, just to follow up on that. So 256th and 259th are the two intersections where you would be interested in a turn signal where that would make a difference in terms of safety. Okay. Yeah. Right, perfect. Um, anything else from any other elected officials? Um, okay, so next I want to call on um, committee members um, if they have questions for um, DOT. Um, so I think uh, David Gelman, you've got your hand up first. Yes, uh, thanks, Deb. Um, uh, you know, I've always said that I think job one of um, uh, government is public safety, and I, I think that this properly uh, addresses it. I would note, you know, I'm, I'm well known, pretty well known to be a cyclist, but honestly, I'll probably never use the, the bike lanes because they're too slow for me. But what I like about it is it provides bike lanes for kids to go to school, to go to Vinmont Park, et cetera. So I think this is a, a very healthy idea. And we should take note of the statistics that um, Ms. Posner um, gave to us that um, there was a, basically an accident a month for the last five years. That's pretty substantial. And I think that that's what, uh, you know, uh, really did prompt this. And I think it will create slightly uh, uh, shorter crosswalks, which I think are helpful. And, you know, will, I think, focus people on the need to go to crosswalks. There's a reason why it's illegal to jaywalk, to, to cut across the middle of a street and not use a crosswalk because it's dangerous. And so I think this will help. Uh, I think this will provide a safe biking route to go up uh, through Yonkers. And frankly, I, I drive and, and bike through there all the time. And I see that it's very lightly traveled and we can uh, afford it. And going over to Broadway is not a good choice because it's actually got a lot of commercial areas, particularly in Yonkers. Whereas Riverdale Avenue, you can take literally all the way up to the Tappan Zee Bridge. And I do that all the time. And it's a much uh, safer way to do it. Um, and the, the net impact I think that this will have is, yeah, probably will slow your, tr your one mile of travel from 254th to 262 uh, from a minute and a half to probably two minutes and 10 seconds. I don't think that's a lot to give up. I think having the turn signal bays are really effectively for the north-south uh, competing drivers versus you know, having their own individual lanes, it's a, effectively the same thing. Um, the, and, you know, the double parking, I think that's a very fair question. We need to do something about the uh, ability of, of uh, uh, parents dropping off their kids or picking up their kids on Riverdale Avenue. We had an agreement with the principal two years ago, three years ago, where all drop off and pick off was done, pick up was done on 254th Street. We need to make sure that happens, that the, the uh, principal enforces it, that the 5-0 precinct enforces it, and frankly, that the entry doors on Riverdale Avenue are kept closed so there will be no um, appeal for trying to drop off or pick up there. Um, so um, the, the, the one other thing, I, I, I did have a question. Uh, how come the bike lanes are not protected, or is that only done by parks? Because the only other places I can think of are Broadway, Central Park West, and I think, um, uh, uh, and uh, Prospect Park West, uh, do you not uh, do protected bike lanes away from a park? Uh, we, we do do protected bike lanes away from parks. 
Okay, so then why was it not considered here or designed for here? Um, honestly, this had the least parking impact for the community. Uh, pro providing a protected bike lane would, would have a bigger impact on the parking. Okay, Great. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you thank you for the answer. If, if, if the community feels strongly about doing a protected bike lane, we could explore that. Uh, this, pr this project is not necessarily a bike project yes there is a bike lane included in it but this is a safety project uh and we're taking road space away from motorists to organize the traffic better to make it safer all the movements along the entire corridor so yes we're adding a painted bike lane but that is not the main motivation of this project Okay, I understand. I think that the protected lanes would be yeah, better yeah. for the it's younger it's children who are likely to be using them going to the schools and Vinmont Park. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, David. Um, I think um, uh, the only other committee member with her hand up is Mary Ellen. Hi, Debbie, thanks. Um, I think it like the bike lanes there and the, between that and the double parking with the parents, I think that's, another accident in the making as well. Um, I, I agree with Assemblyman Dinowitz that I, because I traveled when I used to perform, perform shows up at the Y all the time. You, you need those turn lanes. I think that would be much better. And, um, and I traveled up there and I used to work up that way too. And going up, making left turn lanes going up to 259th Street would be much, you know, much better for the community there than putting all this stuff all over the place. I can just see somebody coming out of those parking things and smacking right into a bicyclist. It, it, Cause they're just gonna wanna pull out and just go. I think that would be a total disaster putting bike lanes there. It's too busy of a road between school buses. Um, you have the Riverdale Express buses, you have the seven bus, you have the 20 bus, the, not the 20, the seven, the 10. It's too much traffic for bike lanes there. You're gonna be smacking down bikers, you know, and, and pedestrians at the same time. It, it's, I think it's a disaster in the making. So 100% what Assemblyman Denowitz said, put those two turn lanes in because th there's a lot of turning into that. I think that would be a great idea. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, I had one question myself, which is what do the bike lanes connect to? I think uh, this was touched on a little bit um, by the councilman, but I wanted to get a sense of how you're envisioning this when you get to the city line. Uh, is it, what, what's, the, what's the plan? And when you get to um, 256, what's the plan? Two, 254. Oh, sorry, 254. So 254, you would cross over to Mashalu Avenue. Okay. Or you can continue down Riverdale Avenue, continue down the service road. Are you going to extend the Sharrows on Mashalu Avenue to that little bit of strip that would connect it to um, to Riverdale Avenue? Just to uh, make yes. it clear? Yes. Okay. And then at the top of the city line, um, then what would what would happen as you're heading into Yonkers? Uh, that uh, we have not uh, spoken to Yonkers yet. Uh, we're first meeting with this community to determine whether this proposal uh, was wanted by the community, uh, but we haven't talked to the to Yonkers. Okay. So my, cyclists would be doing the same thing that they're doing now, which is riding on the street. Um, it, are we you continue planning, to do that. Are you planning on talking to Yonkers or not? We, we generally do when we begin implementation. We do. Okay. We, we did one, uh, we're, we're doing a, a protected bike lane on Webster. And we coordinated with the um, the Westchester County and advised them that we were doing so. And I don't; they haven't provided us with a plan. It's in a different county, a different uh, different city. Uh, but we advised them that we were providing that bike connection. Uh, and it's my understanding that they're looking at what they can do on their side of the border. All right, great. So next I'm going to go to board members. Um, the first one I think who's got their hand up or had their hand up is Bob Bender. I think Chris Calhoun uh, has his hand up. He's a- Oh, member. Chris, do you have your- Oh yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. You're, Chris is on the committee, so he'll, uh, he'll go next and then we'll do Bob Bender. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I also, as Mary Ellen stated, 
uh, wholeheartedly concur with uh, Assemblyman Dinowitz on trying the left turn uh, signals. It can only help. I don't think it can hurt. Um, what's going to happen to all the businesses along the Riverdale Avenue corridor? If you shrink it to one lane, all the trucks are going to double park and block up that one travel lane as these businesses get their much needed goods and supplies. I already see that occurring on Marshallu Avenue, all the way down along the businesses there, they're just double parked trucks. And that's because of the readjustment that went on on that street. As far as safety issues and the speed, there are already three uh, sets of speed cameras already uh, from this, just about the city line from about Mount St. Vincent down which I think are proving to already slow the traffic. So I'm all for safety and improvements, but this sounds like a disaster in the making. Thank you. Um, Chris, one question, because I, I missed that word. Um, did you say that the speed cameras were making the improved, were improving the conditions or were not having an effect? effect? Oh no, okay. I, I believe it is improved. It has improved. I've seen while traveling that corridor, um, Many motorists are very cognizant of exactly where they are. And of course, as soon as you get past one, they don't gun it until you get to the next one. The speed that I have noticed, and maybe somebody else will bring this up, along that corridor uh, seems to be at a very uh, tepid pace. And um, tepid's the wrong word. At a very uh, that's a good, that's a good word. That following the speed limit. Um, uh, 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 Keith or um, uh, any of the representatives, can you did you study what the average travel speed is on Riverdale Avenue now? Can you speak to that? Um, Alicia, do you have that information? I don't have that right now, but I would just say that uh, speed cameras are indeed a tool in the DOT toolbox. Um, unfortunately, they're a limited tool right now, although I know um, many people here are advocating for the hours to be extended. So that's one tool in our toolbox. Um, and engineering, um, changing the configuration of the roadway is another tool. Um, and it's one that can address a number of issues, um, including speeding and also the organization of the roadway, um, the visibility uh, for all users um, and mobility for all users as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I see I the Kelly, a, uh, David, a uh, we, uh, thank you, uh, Dave, uh, Kelly, I saw that you raised your hand. Kelly's also on the committee and then we'll go to, mm -hmm. and we'll go to Bob. Sure, sure. Um, in the interest of time, Deb, I will say that I agree with um, Assemblyman Dumowitz, Mary Ellen and Chris, um, Ms. Posner just addressed my question regarding speed cameras um, in use, um, but my concern, um, my other concern is where we appear to just be putting band-aids on things and not being proactive, and we automatically jump to reconfiguration instead of taking earlier measures um, to sort of help these things along. And go ahead. Oh, no, it's just going to let you finish. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, great, thank you. Um, so I think that that's all the committee folks, right? Um, so I'm gonna then, finally, I'm gonna get to Bob Bender. Uh, Bob, what's your question? Thanks, Deb. Uh, not so much a question, I just wanna say a couple of things. Uh, uh, first of all, for, for uh, everybody else who's on the Zoom, I wanna mention that I am the vice chair of the community board. Also that I am a member of the Riverdale Main Streets Alliance, which I joined last year because I've been impressed by their work with the merchants on Riverdale Avenue, and also their cleanup and beautification efforts on Riverdale and Marshallu Avenues. I'll also mention that I've lived in North Riverdale for more than 30 years. Uh, tonight, DOT has identified a serious safety issue on Riverdale Avenue, and it needs to be addressed. Whether the DOT plan is the right solution is what we're discussing tonight. And I came to this discussion with an open mind. If there are better plans and better ideas than what DOT has put forward, let's talk about them tonight. That's what we're here for. I certainly agree that the issue of left turn signals at West, 250, West 256th and West 259th streets deserves more discussion. And I also join the criticism of DOT 
for not sharing this plan with the community board and elected officials ahead of time as it should have done. That was wrong. But I also want to be clear that the Main Streets Alliance did nothing wrong in communicating with DOT, just as other community groups communicate with city agencies all the time. There were certainly no so-called so -called backroom deals in this project. All it was was a community group advocating for community safety, something that does not deserve criticism. I want to say something about the bike lanes, because every time the subject of bike lanes comes up, it's as though it's a brand new idea that has never been tried before. There are bike lanes all over New York City in front of parking lots and garages, schools, churches, and synagogues. Even if not a single cyclist ever uses the bike lanes, if they cause drivers to pay more careful attention before turning onto Riverdale Avenue, they will have served an important purpose as far as I'm concerned. The DOT statistics we heard tonight say that more than half yeah, the so pedestrians who were struck by cars on Riverdale Avenue were crossing the street with the light. That's terrible. If the bike lanes force drivers to be more attentive, that's not a problem. That's a solution to a problem. And let's be clear what we're talking about when we talk about bike lanes. Two painted lines in the street. If you have to drive in the bike lanes because of some obstruction in the travel lane, you can do that as long as the lane is clear. Somebody brought up Mashalu Avenue. Last year, the same issue came up on Mashalu Avenue when bike lanes were installed, two painted lines. There was, uh, there was all this criticism that the merchants would go out of business. This would be terrible. Nobody could double park uh, to make deliveries, no trucks. Customers couldn't double park. And what happened was everybody went on parking exactly as they did before in the bike lanes. One last thing. Let's please bear in mind that last year, 124 pedestrians and 19 cyclists were killed by drivers in New York City. Nobody was killed by a cyclist last year. And let's please remember that all of us are pedestrians at one time or another. Thanks, Deb. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, next, I think uh, the next board member is uh, Chuck Mordler. Okay, um, so that the record is clear, I am the chair of the Land Use Committee, was the first chair of this board, and have been a member of this board for literally decades. So let me correct some facts here based on actual history. The only advantage of increasing age, if you remember properly still, is that you can relate history. This is not the first time, or even the second or third, that this issue has arisen. In 1964, William Buckley, the publisher of the National Review, proposed a solution to New York's problems in cars. He had a wonderful idea. Make every street one way out of town, and you won't have any problem with cars anymore. Uh, I know I debated him as chairman of his opponent's campaign for this part of the Bronx. And this area that he selected as his example was Riverdale Avenue. And he went through exactly the same kind of a narrative that we hear tonight. Nothing new under the sun. In 2016, the Mainstream Alliance, it was a Main Streets Alliance, it was then called, I think, the Merchants Association, came to the Land Use Committee and talked before it was put in uh, in 2017 about a supposed diet on the parking in the area and the driving and the like. In 2017, it came to the Communities Traffic and Transportation Committee and the Land Use Committee. It was roundly defeated by a lopsided margin. As a result of that, we took a few steps. First, at the request of Assemblyman Dinowitz, we increased, I was on the MTA board at the time, we increased the bus service running up Riverdale Avenue by a significant amount. 
And that was done only on a promise that there would be nothing done by the community to slow the bus service because this was the end of the line. There is no one here in this room who will suggest, I suspect, that this proposal will not slow traffic. It has murdered traffic in Manhattan. Buses from 72nd Street, as I told Adonis Rodriguez on Monday, bus service from 72nd Street in Columbus to 86th Street take a half an hour, thanks to this and the, and the roadway cafe. We did something else, thanks to Laura Spalter. We reached out to the mayor of the city of Yonkers. We didn't wait. We reached out to him. We have been in communication with him on this issue, and we have been in communication with the city of Yonkers and its elected officials on things like the homeless shelters, as Damien McShane and others will be. And they have been extremely supportive. And they are directly relevant here because that's where the cars are coming from. And that's where the midnight speeding is coming from. And there's no dispute about that. We have worked as well in terms of trying to get services done. Now, the Land Use Committee started a process a few weeks ago of trying to look at a few issues. My personal hope had been that the North Riverdale area could be deferred until various facts that are relevant would mature. For example, what is gonna happen in terms of any potential expansion by SAR? What is gonna happen in terms of discussions that have been had concerning affordable housing in this area? What is going to happen in terms of the development that has been proposed of further improvements for merchants and for facilities for them. So all of those factors will clearly have relevance to all of this. And to look at it in isolation, we believe, was inappropriate to let it come. And sure as heck, the governor of the state of New York proposed in the budget, just after we had done this, that all single family home communities would be impacted by effectively destroying one family home zoning. And the city planning commission proceeded to come forward with a whole rezoning proposal of its own. Um, Chuck, I, I, I know this is all important, so I've been holding off, but I just, uh, in the interest of time, because we have a lot of sp speakers, um, can you get uh, closer to wrapping it up? I give you yeah. history. Yeah, right. no, absolutely. So but you, you know a lot of things, so, you know, and you can say a lot of smart stuff for the next two hours, but I just want to make sure to be, you know, cognizant of time, so. I'm perfectly happy to shut up. I'm perfectly happy to continue. You want the point, whatever you want. Do you feel like you've made your point? I just want to make sure you've made your point and then we'll move on to the next person. As soon as I make the points, I'll let you know. The Land Use Committee now has a working group that has started to work in these areas. Julie Reyes, uh, Rosemary Ginty, a zonia, zoning person, planner of, of unquestioned expertise. It's going to have two more members. So we can get some input on traffic. Dan Pattern Act and Marty Warpoff will be asked by me to join it so that we have a full balance of viewpoints from the community as we go through it. There are two issues and the Nature Preservancy is being consulted so that it gets it. We are going to now have to, because of the attention you've drawn to this, focus initially right on this portion of Riverdale. Uh, I'm not sure that's the wisest thing in the world. Let me conclude with one correction, with one piece of information. Somebody asked, how come West 254th Street has a left turn signal and they couldn't do one on 256? The answer is called politics. The MTA on which I served made a simple call and said, we want it because we need to put a bus on. Bingo, done. So that's, that's what drives this agency. That's all that drives this agency, I think. Thank, uh, thank you, Chuck. I'm gonna now move on to uh, Chameleon. And uh, just in the interest of time, we would like to uh, finish this by a quarter to nine, um, if we can. And so just so we can keep it to, to two minutes. 
um, three if you go over, that would be great. Um, Camelia, you're next. Yes, thank you so much. I am here to share the experience uh, of Morris Park Avenue, where I've been working for the past three years as the executive director of the bid uh, before and after the implementation of the exact type of uh, measures to heavy, heavy, heavy opposition of the community, including an actual lawsuit initiated against DOT by the council member at the time. Um, the, the road diet was implemented six months into my tenure, so I observed it for the uh, subsequent uh, two years and a half, including under COVID. I have to say quite clearly that um, just as expected, just as the data informed science has been showing in many, many other corridors, um, the, the redesign of Morris Park Avenue had a positive economic impact on the corridor. And Morris Park Avenue, for those that don't know, has almost an identical configuration to Riverdale Avenue, including an express bus and a regular bus. Um, we had 60 new businesses that opened during COVID and only two businesses closing, so a net positive of, of 14. Um, the numbers that DOT presented, I was not aware of them, but they are quite significant. 42% decrease, 42%. So almost half in, in, in injuries to pedestrian. 37% reduction in damage to vehicles. And um, the number that uh, was referred to for Riverdale 11 was 58% um, um, incidents related to vehicles taking a left turn. And I gotta say for Morris Park Avenue, the biggest benefits reported to to every to by businesses are indeed those left turning base. Um, they are absolutely life saving in terms of uh, fluidity of traffic and reducing in uncertainty. As a parent, I can only think of that turning left, uh, going northbound, going taking my kids to the Riverdale uh, Y. Another important benefit that was not mentioned was that essential central median. I mean, when heavy construction work um, to resurface the road was done recently, there were gigantic construction vehicles all along Morris Park Avenue, yet traffic proceeded in both directions very fluidly, very disciplined, including buses and, and everything with gigantic construction machines on miles of Morris Park Avenue. And uh, finally, again, to put it very simply, I mean, Bob said it quite well, people, they are not moving the sidewalks. They are not narrowing the sidewalks. You know, they are not narrowing the street despite the misleading title in the Riverdale press. Um, no matter how they, if they paint a white line or if they paint zebra stripes, you can still double park all you want. The only difference though, is that there is a fine. I don't remember it's a, if it's 115 or 125 dollars because you, you double park in a in a bike lane this time around but again as any vehicle and all of us double park you know many times in, in, in riverdale avenue as well as morris park avenue and um, sadly are very prone to, to double parking but you double park differently you tend to move much faster than you would normally move away and um, the biggest again just to to underline the biggest advantage of this even though it's very counterintuitive it very much disciplined traffic, it very much um, increased safety and the perception of safety extremely important for for all um, traffic users. From the point of view of businesses, I just want to raise two more points. And so then in a community, done. it's, it's you're three and a half minutes. So can you raise one okay. more point and be done? Sure, I will make just one sentence. One uh, sentence. I'm a little bit concerned. Okay, so I'm a little, uh, I mean, I just wonder if DOT could could um, take into consideration the potential need of dedicated loading zones for some of the business and the impact on the open street restaurants. Uh, but I'm fairly, I'm absolutely positive that there will be solutions that accommodate both the proposal and the actual needs of businesses. Thank you so much, Deb. Okay, great, thank you. And that's a perfect segue to Nick Fazio, our Chair for Economic Development. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I would like to just read a letter that I received from Enzo Ferriangi from Riverdale Bagels, if that's okay with you, Deb. Yep, sure. On behalf of Riverdale Bagels, which I manage, uh, and other merchants located along 5654 to 5699, 
Riverdale Avenue, we adamantly oppose the proposed traffic changes on Riverdale Avenue. This plan, in our opinion, is ill-conceived and will not uh, address the safety concerns that we, we have. Uh, however, it will be detrimental uh, to the businesses on the avenue, not considering uh, the other traffic issues that will be caused during school drop-off and snow removal. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Fazio, would you uh, address with DOT the needs to, re to, re to review this plan again? Um, adding a bike lane will reduce parking, already a problematic issue for us, and it does not solve the safety issue. The installation of speed cameras has had an impact, and uh, Riverdale Avenue does need to be repaved and stripped, not reinvented. Uh, truly yours, Enzo. Very Angie, and that was dated March 29th, 2022. I think it's repaved and striped. Oh, correct. Thank you. <laughs> Stripping is not allowed on Stripped. Riverdale Avenue, just to be clear. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. Did, uh, did you have anything else you want to say, Nick, or was you just want to read it? No, I just wanted to, to read the letter um, and uh, just encourage DOT to continue to engage with the merchants and, and uh, take their concerns seriously. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, Rob Spolter and, and then uh, Bob Benuzzi. I think that would be, oh, and then Laura. So uh, Rob Spolter great. next. Uh, you're still muted. Thank you. There you All go. Right. All right. Um, how much revenue does New York State or city receive from registrations, licensing, insurance, tolls, taxes, and fines from bicyclists? Zero re revenue or accountability. We drivers are held accountable by these regulations and responsibilities. A nine block bike lane to nowhere has absolutely nothing to do with transportation or community. This is just a one size fits all solution in search of a problem. Your logic is to funnel traffic to create difficult driving. There is no amount of paint that can prevent reckless and careless driving. Speeding cannot happen in a crowded roadway during the day. Late at night with no traffic, only enforcement might possibly help. I also fear that people will be using the left turn lane to pass one of the many buses and trucks uh, on Riverdale Avenue when they're stuck behind them. This could be catastrophic. Your plans do not adequately address fuel deliveries, deliveries to businesses, emergency vehicles, ceaseless street repairs, not to mention the parents dropping off and picking up their children and making egress from driveways along the route. There are many things to enhance safety that could be done. More red light and speed, speed cameras, enhanced crosswalks, crosswalks with four-way red lights to allow safer crossing, and of course, synchronizing these traffic lights to establish a 20-mile or 25-mile-an-hour speed limit. Raised crosswalks that were painted from curb to curb with slow cars and cycles. Assemblyman Jeff Dinowitz has lobbied DOT for years for a left turn arrow at West 256th Street, and the community board has endorsed that. You mentioned the Main Street Alliance, which is the same group that originally proposed this plan, who sent you multiple letters demanding a study. Then you cite data showing fatalities from four to seven years ago before the red light and speed cameras were implemented, just to justify your plans. You cite fender benders with rear end impact as indicative of speeding. Evidently, you've never driven in a lane of moving traffic when the car up ahead stops suddenly because of an unexpected danger, such as a pedestrian or a bike appearing out of nowhere. The cars behind don't see that danger and are unable to stop in time. Nobody leaves two or three car lanes in moving traffic. Uh, you initiate your, your secret so-called studies based on one or two requests that fit your narrative. No one has ever seen the details of your study. Do you consider hundreds of requests to abandon it for the people who live and work here? Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Rob. Um, next is uh, Bob Benutzi. Thanks, Deb. Um, speaking as a resident of uh, North Riverdale, I live off of 259th, um, and I'm also a community board member. Um, so as many of us know, Riverdale Ave is already functionally uh, one lane of traffic for long stretches. Um, and um, I'm having trouble figuring out how this will impact the school, um, PS81. Um, 
so I had that question for Alicia and Keith about um, if there's going to be a transition or whether the project limit includes PS81. Um, and please don't tell me because that we just need more enforcement or more need help from school because, like I said, I've been here for 20 years on the board and living here and it hasn't happened now and it's never going to happen. So you have to deal with that as a given. Um, I think what Camelia said about the loading zones is really important because that's another place where the current two lanes become one lane. And so, I, again, I just want to ask, how do you deal in the Morris Park or other areas, busy commercial areas, with loading zones um, that take place in a uh, place where people are going to park? Okay, I know you're trying to forbid parking there, but there is going to be a place, um, and for lack of, you know, for better or worse, people are double parking to load, and then they are able to travel with that one lane. We don't like it. Nobody likes it, but that's what happens. Um I did have a comment about the bike lane and whether it's always included in this. As everybody knows, I'm a big bike supporter and I was one of the few people who voted for the Broadway plan, which I think has been great for the community. I just have to say, I'm totally on board with that as a bike conduit because it was part of an access to the park. I'm having a little more trouble understanding the bikeway route. And I just wanna hear about it because I think that's a really important part of knowing when you build a bike lane is going somewhere and it's greenway as everybody knows it's about connectivity i guess my last point would be in question would be is there anything negotiable now the one thing we do seem to have in common is we all want that left turn signal at 256 where i turn every day and there would have been a lot of problems solved with a the light there um, Chuck, I'll just say that that was Ollie, I think, Capel, who came down hard on the 254th uh, left-hand turn, and we're all better for that one. So um, maybe we can have a return to form for that uh, light at 256. So Keith, it was, um, are there any negotiable pieces to this? What happens in loading zones in other areas? And um, is how do you deal with the school traffic? All very lifestyle, quality of life things that happen to us North Riverdaleans every day. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Um, so as I stated earlier, this is not a bike lane project specifically. This is a traffic calming project. We yeah. could, in theory, um, do this four to three conversion uh, without the bike lane, if yes. that's the biggest concern. Uh, but we would prefer to use the space uh, for bicyclists to identify where bicyclists should safely be traveling on this road. But again, this is not this was not meant as a bike lane yeah. expansion project this Fair is enough. a this is a usage of extra space of the roadway uh okay. to, and we're using that extra 10 feet that that provides the center flush median that allows for the left turn bays and we're using that extra 10 feet as a bike lane identifying where bicyclists should safely be and where motorists can expect them to be um the i think the other two questions were essentially very similar is one is it's all about it? parking at the standing at the curb versus standing right. in, in what would be the bike lane or what is currently in the travel lane so let's go with the deliveries yeah. deliveries uh um we can look at delivery um loading zones uh along the riverdale avenue corridor if that is something that the community is requesting we would be open to that to providing dedicated space specifically for commercial vehicles to load and unload in areas along the commercial areas so that is another thing that we're happy to talk further about the the segment of roadway be, between 256 and 254 right now operates as a one lane roadway during arrival and dismissal it operates now as a one lane roadway. So okay, there would essentially be no change other than that there would now be a left turn bay dedicated to vehicles turning left in either direction. I think the question was, uh, is there a way to improve it that often people are unable to get through in the current configuration? 
Uh, well, the only other option is to provide one through lane, dedicated through lane, through narrowing the roadway. We're moving a lane. So now they would be able to park adjacent to the curb and then essentially double park in the bike lane, which yeah. you shouldn't be doing anyway, but. Yeah. So Keith, current, the current policy is to allow for drop-off, the double parking, and you're saying in practice, it's a one lane uh, because of this school drop-off policy and that would continue. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the drop-off policy at the school that someone mentioned earlier, some sort of agreement with the community. And the school, I'm not familiar with that policy. Well, we've just, we've had a lot of double parking and um, it's become like what I was saying, northbound, it's become a, a one lane road already. Um, so I was concerned about what would happen to through traffic if there was um, no lane for people to double park it. Well, you would still during, have- During, 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 during drop off. You would still have about. the five foot buffer to- in the what is essentially would be a bike lane, the bike, the lane. double okay. park lane, the double park in. Keith, okay. if I could could also add, you know, we, um, to people's earlier points about the design, let us not forget that school drop off and pickup is about thirty minutes, beginning and end of each day, or, and the flush median would be in the in the center of the street. If we need to temper, if people need to temporarily overtake a vehicle that is double parked, there will be no mm. physical impediment to those vehicles overtaking. What we do find at schools throughout the city, this is a constant problem. And you're right, no one's we're, no one's going to send PD here to enforce this rule. What we also find at at school drop off and pick up throughout the city is the streets usually as calm as possible because there's so many vehicles kind of slowing things down. Um, yes, illegally, but, but, but it does, does slow yeah. vehicles as they are proceeding um, away from the school. Well, I just wanted to know, I guess the gist of my question was whether it makes congestion worse um, because it is di very difficult to leave um, my home during those hours because of what I'm describing. So I'm just, concerned about the um, narrowing uh, or, you know, there's five feet now, like you're saying, I get that, but it could make congestion there worse. And I was wondering whether you have any study, you're saying there, you have anecdotal information about this in front of schools, um, but it is a concern, I think, for the community. Yeah. And de definitely we want to make sure that already congested situation doesn't get worse. It's really tough there right now. Keith, we could also meet with us. We have not yet met, met with the school right. and we can meet with them to talk more about their regulations, curbside regulations there. Yeah, I would I would suggest that. OK, yeah, I would say certainly, you know, we don't encourage um, double parking at school drop off, but we know it's a problem at this school and schools throughout the city. Um, so we're happy to speak to the school more and we you know, it sounds like the board already has an ongoing conversation with the school. Cool. So um, we'd appreciate community input um, to the school as well. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, that'd be great. Um, and now the uh, board chair, uh, Laura Spalter. Hi, I'll be brief because uh, we're anxious to hear from the public. Um, I think it's important to, you know, review where we are, how we got here. Um, it's been said already that the board in 2017 uh, rejected the uh, North Riverdale Merchant Association's plan, which is basically the same plan that is before us tonight. Um, what I'd like to add to that is in response to the board's resolution, the um, then borough commissioner Navarro Lopez uh, wrote the board and said, and this is uh, 2018, at this time, the Department of Transportation does not have any plans or studies underway to implement the conversions recommended in the NRMA streetscape report. DOT will take the board's comments into consideration as we review any future proposals and look forward to working with the board's traffic and transportation committee on projects concerning Riverdale Avenue. Then uh, fast forward to just a year ago uh, when um, commissioner and I spoke about Riverdale Avenue he reiterated that travel lanes would not be reduced. He indicated that's not on the table. So my issue is that 
one, the board only learned of this proposal last month. We didn't see the presentation until three days ago. And we would have liked, as the letter indicated, to have discussed alternatives to this plan. And we still want to do that. And most importantly, the board and the public would like to believe that this is not a done deal. I think that also this board looks at things in terms of equity issues for DOT's priorities, our priorities. And according to the 50th precinct, and we've had several back and forths on this, Riverdale Avenue, particularly in North Riverdale, is not where the greatest need is for safety improvements. Um, they still look at the Broadway corridor, um, especially in the area of 231st and uh, 225th, you know, as the greatest problem. And for months, this TNT committee has been discussing the area of Bailey Avenue, um, you know, because they are in very dire need of safety improvements. So, you know, we have to look at data offered tonight and compare it to data in uh, other parts of Community Board 8 when looking at our priorities here. Um, last year, 2021, there were 13 accidents on the strip from 254 uh, with four injuries. There were no fatalities. There were no accidents involving bicyclists. There was one pedestrian accident. But when you compare that with something like Broadway in Kingsbridge, where you had 117 accidents, 46 with injuries, 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 six with bikes, 16 with pedestrians. You know, the data is important, but you have to compare it to other data. Um, my last point is, because you'll hear plenty from the public, um, is we need a moratorium on this proposal. What is being presented tonight for the first time uh, we need to consider how and by whom this main artery is used. And we need to look at alternatives. And thank you. Thank you for presenting and thank you for this opportunity to respond. Laura, thank you for highlighting the concerns about Broadway. We will definitely take a look at Broadway and perhaps come back to the board with, it, with, with safety improvements for Broadway. We appreciate we'll your you endorsement you of that. come to us. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, thank, thank you, Laura. Um, also, I would, it would be remiss if I didn't just say Bailey again, because Bailey Avenue is, is right up there with Broadway. Um, Rosemary Ginty, I think you're next. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Deb, thank you. And, and uh, I'm very much taken with your comments, Laura. They're very well stated and uh, everything you said needed to be said. But let me be very brief. This is, um, uh, can anybody, can somebody mute themselves? It's really rude. Uh, uh, I think most people on the, this Zoom know that um, uh, we have not seen uh, this proposal. Uh, there must be a new a new policy in DOT not to share it with the community board. It was not seen. Okay, so I want to know: Can we get a copy of the tonight's presentation? And if we do get a copy of it, is it possible that it be put on our website so that people in the community and people in general can see it? There were numbers, there were facts, there were lines, there were drawings. It's something you can't just flash it in front of somebody and it's gone. So can we get a copy? And if we if we get one, if the policy changes so we can have it, uh, can it go on uh, our, our website? Just, uh, just a, a final thought. This is the first time that we've seen this, the first time. There's a lot to consider and a lot to digest, and it has important repercussions in this neighborhood. I see 146 people on Zoom. We have a duty to these people. They want to be heard. I want to hear what they have to say. What is the next public step in this? Uh, what, to the extent that there is a plan, when is the next time people can look at this, consider it, and, and tell us, it, it, beside tonight, tell us what they think about it and tell DOT what they think about it. Those are, those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, the, once we present to, the, to, the, to you guys tonight, we will make the presentation available on our website and you can link it 
to anybody you want. Link it to your own website if you if you want to. That's fine. And then I think our second question was um, a timeline um, for this work, and if there's an opportunity for us to post the you know post or link the presentation so more people have an opportunity to see it, digest it, and then yeah. we can come back with a resolution. Yeah, after tonight we'll post it probably first thing in the morning on our website, and we'll send you the link. Mm -hmm. And then you can share it with whomever you want. Oh, I meant timeline for, doing, for doing the work itself. I'm sorry. This I meant plan, for doing we, we're presenting this plan now, but this is, we're, this is a proposal for this summer. Okay. So, so uh, sometime this, some point this summer, you'll work on it. Okay. That's the plan. Yep. And then when it comes to the community board, what is our plan to have more, uh, more public space for people to speak and give their thoughts? Just do we have a plan yet? Is that a question for the Is that for me board? or is that for Keith? And maybe it's rhetorical. Well, we'll, we'll this, get is us that we get this is us formally presenting the plan to you. And so yeah. with this information, you guys can mull it over, discuss it amongst yourselves, have, you know, discussions with each other and get back to us on your thoughts about it. Um, excuse me, Keith, I'm excuse me, but in researching the Morris Park plan, uh, I noted that you had several public meetings before doing anything, not one, but several. I got that from news articles and you know whatnot about that plan. So I hate to think that this is this is it. Are you inviting me back? Yes. Then I'll, I'd come back if you want to have another discussion about. It, we can have another discussion about it. Okay. There were several. There were several discussions with the boards and with the elected officials um, before Mars Park took place. I, I just noting that. Land use will invite him for the May meeting. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that that is that is all of our board members. We had some folks um, specifically from uh, who requested to speak. Um, so I just want to go through their names real quick. Uh, Damien McShane, are you here? I see your hand. Um, you would be next. Yes, I'm here. Thanks a lot. Um, and so just and just so everybody's aware. So take two minutes. They're like you know, try to keep it short. Um, but full, and then we'll go through the list of folks who are on the speakers list, and then I'll open it up to anybody else who has their hand up until we get to a, a time, the time limit. But I'll try to make sure everybody speaks. Uh, Damien, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a little history. I'm the former chair of the board. I'm the former traffic and transportation committee chair. I'm an actual transportation professional, and I have been roped into being the current chair of the Riverdale Main Street Alliance. So just real quick on their history, it's a not-for-profit. Uh, the goals are to promote businesses, do street cleanups, and, and really to promote traffic safety. So in 2017, I just wanna clear up some misconceptions and, and clarify what went on back then. <clears throat> Excuse me, I actually attended the meeting because I live on Lee Big Avenue. I was very involved in local community organization back then. And I had concerns with what they were proposing. And what they proposed, by the way, was a comprehensive re-envisioning of this corridor. Um, again, it touched on all of their key uh, stated goals, beautification, business improvement, and I have a long relationship with Chuck Merler, so it pains me to contradict him, but the board passed a resolution that overwhelmingly supported the majority of the proposals in their plan. Um, it rejected one proposal, and that proposal was not to implement a road diet, but it was to do a traffic study to either validate or undermine uh, the proposal they made for a road diet. So just a little history there. Um, just fast forward to today. Um, again, I'm a transportation professional, um, not to date myself, but many, many years ago in, in graduate school, I was exposed to these concepts. Uh, road diets are not a novel idea. They're widely deployed throughout the country. Uh, this is taught in every traffic engineering program in the country. Uh, it is endorsed and I assume presented uh, by a licensed professional engineer as it was by the North Riverdale 
uh, Merchants Association five years ago. Um, I know it's also counterintuitive to think going from three, excuse me, four lanes to three uh, would actually improve throughput, but modeling and, and real world data shows that it does. Um, travel speeds increase slightly, at least that's what the uh, North Riverdale Merchants Association's preliminary report showed years ago. Um, and, and the throughput, again, would increase slightly. So cut to the chase, and, and here's the ask here. Um, I appreciated the opportunity to see DOT's plan. Again, I think we were somewhat uniquely qualified to comment on that based on the licensed professionals that sit on our board and my own experience in the transportation industry. Uh, and at that meeting, I encouraged them to engage community board. Um, I specifically asked that they provide um, modeling data that they use for this road diet plan. That information would reflect what they proposed or what they anticipate the travel times and throughput to be uh, okay. on Riverdale Avenue. And I encourage them to provide that report to the community board. There should be what's called the stage one report floating around out there, if not a final design. Uh, and I also asked at that time that they provide, again, the real world data, real world data on what they did in particular at Morris Park. Um, I appreciate the comments from other speakers that noted how successful that's been. Uh, and I think that that information would be very relevant to this discussion and ultimately in the board's determination whether or not to support this. My own organization, the Main Street Alliance, has not. Uh, weighed in one way or the other. Again, I am in favor of this based on my professional experience, uh, but we wanted to hear from the community before we took our vote. And thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you, thank you, Damian. Uh, next is Sarah Hughes from St. Margaret's Church here. If not, I can come back. I can check the end. Um, Barbara Connolly, president of Riverdale Gardens. I'm here. I'm Sarah. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, wait. Uh, Sarah's here. Sarah, there's an echo. Yeah, but Sarah's here. I just wasn't near my computer. Okay. Uh, so Sarah will go oh. and then Barbara will go. Uh, so Barbara, right, I'm from. Hold, uh, Barbara, uh, hold on one moment while Sarah speaks. Do you have your picture showing? No, no. I'm, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Father McCarthy. I work for St. Margaret's, and um, this is something he wrote. Yep, I, I think use the proposed road diet on Riverdale Avenue as the pastor of St. Margaret of Cotona, St. Gabriel's, located at 6000 Riverdale Avenue, I'm aware of the congestion that currently exists on Riverdale. Reducing the number of lanes on, the, on it would increase the current congestion and create a hardship for our parishioners and school families. Our church has two daily masses, Monday to Saturday, and five additional masses on Sunday, including a vigil mass on Saturday evening. In addition, there are numerous funerals each week. Our parishioners enter and exit our parking lot via Riverdale Avenue. Their, their use of the lot will be hindered with increased congestion that will undoubtedly result from the reduction of lanes. Currently, Riverdale Avenue is the main corridor for two city bus lines and three express bus lines as well as numerous yellow school buses that use it. The city of New York has taken measure to ensure that Riverdale Avenue is safe. These include a number of traffic cameras, one which is located just south of 261st Street on the west side of Riverdale. These steps and others increased crossing time at 259th Street and Riverdale have created a safe, more to pedestrian friendly environment. Reducing the driving lanes from four to two with a left hand turn lane will increase the danger as motorists will be in a hurry to make lights and move through the area. Our parish has over 200 res registered 2000, families. 2000. 2000, I'm sorry, 2000 registered families. The reduction of traffic lanes will adversely affect any movement our parishioners and neighbors can make. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Barbara Connolly. Uh, Barbara, are you there? Oh, for crying out loud, get on with it. You weren't here just a minute ago, Barbara. Okay, well, we'll come back to you. Lee Chong. Is Lee Chong Thank on you. the phone? My name is Lee Chong. I'm uh, a member of the Riverdale Senior Services 
Social Action Committee, and I'm here to speak about the seniors. In this area, there are close to 7,000 seniors uh, the age of, over the age of 60. There are also, to talk about the other generation, there are close to 6,500 young, child, young children and adults that live in the area. And also what has been mentioned is the bus routes, the church, the educational institutions, and in addition, the two major residential areas that total over 1,700 units, Netherland Gardens and Skyview. And then the, of course, the commercial space businesses, Skyview Shopping Center, the restaurants, the banks, the drugstores, and the post office, all of these things. I agree with what assembly member Dinowitz said that we need to think first about increasing the speed traffic lights and make them 24 seven and having the turn lane. I don't think reducing the number of lanes is going to be a safety improvement. I think as um, Sarah said on behalf of the pastor. Okay, so you come back on and, and I and the social action committee does not support oh, this perfect. current plan. Thank you. Yes. yes thank you, Liz. <clears throat> um, next would okay. be Michael Good. Heller. Is Michael on the call? Yes. The floor is yours. Oh, I'm sorry, you've been you were muted by my overzealous muting assistant. Oh, now I'm there unmuted. <laughs> yes, hello uh, again. My name is Mike Heller. I'm a former member of this community board and was chairman of this committee. Uh, thank you for giving me uh, two minutes to speak. Uh, I've seen these three lane systems from around the city and I disagree in a real world experience. I don't think they're terribly effective in this particular area with double parking and dropping off on, from PS81. I think it's gonna be a, an unbelievable traffic uh, nightmare. I think it's sort of interesting the DOT representative says, well, don't worry about the bike lane. Don't worry about the big fat center medium. If you're gonna make your own lane out of that during this time, go ahead. You know, that's to be expected. And in fact, I think that is true. I used to work in the Mill Basin area in the very bottom of Brooklyn. And every once in a while when the Bell Parkway was bumper to bumper, which was about 90% of the time, I would make the fatal decision of driving up Flatbush Avenue to the Prospect Expressway. I hadn't done it for a while and I discovered my God, they turned Flatbush Avenue, a hugely popular roadway in Brooklyn into this three lanes. And it was a disaster. When a bus tried to pull over, if someone was double parked or parked within the bus turnout lane, the whole travel lane came to a dead halt. Now nobody really wanted to swerve into that big fat striped center medium because they said, what, kind of what kind of a ticket am I going to get if I do something like that? So I don't think this is very effective. And the other thing of course is, you know, the idea of building a bike lane just because it takes up territory and it's going to slow traffic down. I don't quite understand building bike lanes to nowhere. It isn't as if we're all members of the Flat Earth Society. We live uh, adjacent to the city line and Westchester County. So a bike lane to nowhere, to, to, to Yonkers, where you go back down to being on the regular streets, I just don't understand this. Of course, it's the same thing on the south end when you're on the four lanes of the service road of the Henry Hudson Parkway. So this whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm a long-term resident. I've actually lived in, in Riverdale and in the West Bronx my whole life. And I remember when Riverdale Avenue was surfaced with red pavers. It was very beautiful. And it never occurred to me to be a particularly dangerous street. Now what Riverdale, Riverdale Avenue really needs is to be completely resurfaced. Con Edison has torn the street to smithereens over the past 10 years with various electric projects. It's roughly paved, there are big potholes, there are big dips, there are patches that don't match up with each other. So Riverdale Avenue really needs completely to, to be completely resurfaced one end to the other. And Keith, since this really isn't the main topic, I'm gonna to throw this out anyway. Many people here know that the northbound Henry Hudson Parkway service road after being in terrible condition was resurfaced last fall. Last fall. I have to tell you, United Paving Crews did an absolutely miserable job resurfacing northbound Riverdale Avenue. It already has potholes in it. It was resurfaced four or five months ago. You have pothole crews filling potholes on a recently resurfaced street. It's uneven, it's a really sloppy job, and whoever was responsible for this job should be severely disciplined and otherwise. So I think DOT should pay more attention to the quality of the streets that are turning into cow paths, and you know, rather than just slapping lines down, uh, which makes traffic planners happy. Thank you for your time. 
Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, the, uh, the board has been actually following up with the Hello, this is Barbara Connolly. Wait, oh, wait, wait, wait a second, Barbara. Um, so the board has been following up with DOT regarding the northbound uh, Henry Hudson service road um, because of the, uh, the poor paving. Uh, uh, Keith, do you have any update on that? I think you were going to send someone, a team to go look at it? I don't have an update tonight for you. I can get a few tomorrow. Okay. That would be great. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Good. And thank you, Mike, for raising it. Um, uh, Barbara Connolly, I believe you said you're here. Barbara? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, you're, you're feeding back. Do you have another? Um. Do you, um, Barbara, do you have uh, your phone on? Are you, um, it seems like you may have uh, somebody else is on the, the same call. Can you hear me now? You're, you're still feeding back. She probably has her phone and her Yeah, do you have your phone on or do you have your computer on? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go on, move on to Deidre Burke. Hi, I think I've unmuted myself. Can you hear me? You have, you have successfully unmuted yourself. The floor is oh, yours. Boy, I feel like a real techie. Um, <laughs> first, I'd like to request that the uh, Department of Transportation provide all of the underlying data on Riverdale Avenue and other, other um, projects in the area. There's a need for transparency. Clearly, we don't trust them. And it's not the Main Street Alliance's fault. But the DOT chose to go to them and not to the community at large. Um, in terms of this transparency, we'd like to know accidents that have occurred after the, after the uh, speed cameras were installed. I mean, is there anything and else we'd like to know why, the, why going from four lanes to two will reduce accidents. Now, I know that everybody says it's happened elsewhere. My cat is trying to walk across the screen. But let's take a look at Morris Park. Anybody who's been on the west side, the west section of Mars Park Avenue realizes that it is the wild, wild west. People can't get into driveways. People drive, especially during rush hour, people drive on the wrong side, make terrible driving decisions. I've gone over there a couple of times to take a look at that because it's supposed to be analogous to Riverdale Avenue. Taking that analogy a little bit further, this plan does not take into account all of the places where people will make a turn. St. Margaret's parking lot, the other parking lots, the post office, the driveways. There are no turning lanes for them. So people will have to cross dangerously across these lanes of traffic. My thought is something that's done in other places if you wanna reduce traffic lanes, is have a, keep the four lanes, kill the bike lane and have a center lane where you can make turns at any time. It's done out in um, Suffolk County in many places and it has resulted in slower traffic. I would request that all of the experts from the Department of Transportation, their engineers and their traffic people come up with other plans. It seems as though this is the Hobson's choice and this is the only choice. We reduce the traffic lanes and what will happen on Riverdale Avenue like the west side, the west part of Morris Park is that traffic will come to a standstill and drivers will do stupid things. Morris Park has two bus lanes, bus lines, we have five. We spoke about 81. There are other it's, schools. It's three minutes, I'm gonna to have to- Okay, to I'm sorry. Yeah. No, there are other schools happening. there. And just as an educational professional, 
the things that you've said about, not you, the things that someone said about planning for 81 are ridiculous. But anyway, I would like the Department of Transportation to not go ahead with this because it seems like it's a done deal until they can provide all of the underlying data and consider other plans. Thank you. Thank, and look at Morris you, Park on the west side. It is a disaster. Uh, Keith, do you want to address um, the, the the situation, the the question that Deidre <laughs> raised of why not do a four, leave the four lanes, eliminate the bike lane, and put in a turn lane? I saw you nodding your head. Uh, it would require the removal of parking. Right. So I mean, actually, we can take a look actually, at it. Actually, it's ten. You still have the ten feet for that center lane. Mathematically, it works. It but doesn't take a work. look at it and make a promise that you're not going to go ahead with this it, it until doesn't you work. consider and present other you need, plans. You need so 20 Deidre, feet. So, so Deidre, only one person should speak at a time. So you, you can't maintain both, all four lanes, okay. with a turning lane in each direction. The ro roadway is not wide enough without the removal okay. of parking. Okay, thank, thanks, Keith. I'm going to move on to uh, Tara, Mc, Tara Mc, uh, Barbara, hold on. Uh, I can, I can actually see you and hear you, so I'm going to let you go. Yes. I, hopefully I can stay on. Seize the moment. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Barbara Connolly, and I'm president of the Riverdale Garden Tenants Association. Our development is right on Riverdale Avenue. It's between 256th Street, that terrible corner, and 255th Street. We go back past Netherland to Arlington, and our biggest concern is the removal of one traffic lane on Riverdale Avenue going north or south. I'm not sure which way it's gonna, but in the morning, three lanes cannot accommodate east and west side buses, two lines of city buses, rail link buses, school buses, garbage trucks, vans, cabs, delivery trucks, accessoride, which a lot of our tenants take, and cars with residents trying to get to work, to school, to church, to temple, to the Skyview Shopping Center, to doctor appointments, and up to the Riverdale Y, not to mention emergency services and snow plows in the winter. What's not on the map, and I was trying to notice it and, and wished you had put down, is that our development has a back drive that exit right onto Riverdale Avenue at 255th Street. And the building, the development next to us, which is Riverdale Park, their development exits onto Riverdale Avenue and enters onto Riverdale Avenue. In the morning, 256th Street has three garages that enter onto 256th Street and go, they, no, they, they enter onto 256th Street. They have to go down to Riverdale Avenue and go north or south. With, with, you know, with one lane gone, it would be extremely dangerous. Another concern is the health. We're concerned about air and noise pollution. Many of our apartments face Riverdale Avenue. Some have terraces. And some, a lot of our tenants do have asthma, emphysema problems. With one lane gone, stalled vehicles idling in three lanes would just exacerbate these problems. We're also then, uh, worried Barbara, about- I'm gonna give, uh, Barbara, I'm gonna give you a two minute warning. So if you could wrap up. Okay. Um, we're worried about traffic, which can't get down Marshalou or, or over to Broadway, turning the side streets of Riverdale into streets to get down to Broadway because Riverdale traffic is so backed up in the morning. Please take these concerns into consideration. This is just one development. There are just many know. others beside us. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Barbara. I'm glad you were able to get on. Um, uh, Tara McMaster? Mm -hmm. No, you actually look like you were looking at the screen. It didn't, I knew you were reading it because it's not your usual is this, statement. Is this but... uh, Tara McMaster? No, it's Deirdre. Yeah, Deirdre, Deirdre, Deirdre. Deirdre. Here, I'll, mute, I'll mute Deirdre. Is uh, Tara, uh, Tara McMaster there? Okay, I'm going to move on. Olga Robertella? Uh, uh, Robert O'Brien. No, oh, I see Bob O'Brien. Uh, Bob, do you want to go? Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, Sue Dodell. 
Yes, hi, my name is Sue Dodell. I've lived a block from the corner of Riverdale Avenue and West 259th Street for almost 40 years. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify in opposition to this proposal. Um, I attended the community board meeting in 2017, uh, which we've discussed. Uh, there was a lot of community opposition to that proposal. So I'm very surprised that this is back uh, again. I'm disappointed that DOT shared the proposal with the Riverdale Main Streets Alliance before sharing it with the community board or the public. I can't address this in very specifically, but I'll testify based on the brief description of the proposal that was in the uh, public hearing notice. I think it makes no sense to reduce the number of traffic lanes um, on Riverdale Avenue. Riverdale Avenue is a, a terribly busy street with hills that make it um, difficult to, to safely drive a car, let alone a bike. Uh, traffic on the street already is blocked twice a day when PS 81 and St. Margaret's School begin and end their school days. I took photos of the street on a recent Friday afternoon between 3 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. I've submitted those photos to the board. You can see that cars are double parked along Riverdale Avenue so that the street uh, already effectively has been made into one lane north and one lane south. Residents can't drive on Riverdale Avenue or cross the street safely during these drop-offs and pickups. The thought of adding two bike lanes to this chaotic situation is frightening. Also, there are outdoor cafes in the street, not just on the sidewalk, on Riverdale Avenue, just south of West 259th Street, which already obstruct a traffic lane, adding to congestion. At any hour, it's difficult to walk safely across or drive on or near Riverdale Avenue. Uh, I don't see cyclists using the nearby Mashalu Avenue bike lane. That street has become dangerous to maneuver around with double and triple parked cars. Why should we add two bike lanes to our area where there's no demand for it? Um, the bike lanes would reduce the number of parking spots in the area. It would cause uh, drivers to create more uh, air pollution as they look for parking spots, more congestion on the streets. If cyclists want to go north or south, they can use the Broadway bike lane, which is just a few blocks away or cyclists can use side streets where they'll be a lot safer than on Riverdale Avenue. So I Sue, think- Sue Dodell, just a, um, this is your uh, two minute warning. That yes, you, okay, I'm good. I only have like uh, just a very brief, uh, the bike lanes in other parts of the city appear to me to be used primarily by e-bikes, which are dangerous to pedestrians. Uh, I think bike lanes do not enhance safety they endanger pedestrians. I personally have come close to being killed several times by reckless cyclists in bike lanes. So I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I urge you not to support the suggested changes to this portion of Riverdale Avenue. Thank you again. Great, thank you, Sue. Uh, next, Dana Carlton. The last person on our list, Dana Carlton. Okay. I see you, Ross. Don't worry, I'm coming. I'm coming back. So now I'm going to go. Um, <laughs> so now I'm going to go up to Vittorio Bugatti. He's uh, had his hand up for um, quite some time. Uh, luckily, it's an electronic hand and not a physical hand. Or he yeah. Was, so he, um, it's a workout. I, I, yeah, I, I want to say a couple of things. First off, um, yeah, two I minutes. Say that, sure. I, uh, first off, I, I want to say directly to Keith that um, I oppose this plan because. I have asked for paving along the same stretch that we're talking about, milling and paving going back to last July. We are still waiting for milling and paving. We have a number of streets in our district that have what well, were supposed to have been milled and paved last year, and we're still waiting. So I don't understand how it is that there are resources available to put down bike lanes immediately, and we can't get basic milling and paving of our streets. And you're talking about safety of streets where people are falling down when they're trying to cross the street because there's so many craters and potholes. In this very presentation, we see that there are craters and potholes right along the same stretch that we're talking about here. Uh, if you look at some of the, of the, of the uh, presentation that you presented, we see it in that particular presentation. So I cannot support this plan because if we're talking about putting down bike lanes 
where we have craters and potholes everywhere, I don't see how anyone can actually use the street, whether it be pedestrians, cyclists, anyone that drives, or anyone that commutes. I am okay. a long-term commuter. Uh, I've been living in Riverdale for at least 15, almost 15 years now. I also have serious concerns about uh, the express buses because I commute into Manhattan. Uh, we have uh, many people that are in my advocacy group, which I run for express bus service, that have concerns um, about their commutes being even longer because of all the congestion uh, along this particular stretch. And we do not have subways in this part of Riverdale. So we are very dependent on buses. Um, and we actually have six buses that are running because we also have to include the, the Hudson Rail Link. So this is a big problem and a big concern that we have. And I just want to say we need to really focus on milling and paving our street because I was walking um, to the Metro North Station the other day along so, the- uh, So Victoria, I'm going to stop you because it's two minutes. Um, also sure. because I have, um, I, I do want to say that for anybody, if you have um, paving issues that you see, please submit it to DOT directly, the block, um, the name of the street in the block and submit it to the office. We follow up on those regularly to make sure that they get onto the list and DOT, whenever we send it to them, they always go in and, and they'll, they go look at it and um, ascertain when it was last paved. So if there's, if there's streets that just simply have fallen in the cracks, no pun intended, um, let report it to DOT, let the board know so that we can you know, follow up on it and we'll, uh, we'll get to it. Also keep in mind, we do have some private streets or partially owned streets or streets with fun funky um, designations. And so sometimes that can also be a complication, but definitely send it into DOT into the board office. Okay, Thanks. absolutely. Um, so next up, uh, Ross Freeman. I, you're muted. Thank you, I appreciate it. Listen, I'm um, the president of the 256th Street Homeowners Association, <laughs> and I represent all of the people who live across from PS81. I've been here for the past 20 years. I've worked with the DOT and Navardo Lopez and Community Board to change the signage on our street because of the problems we've had with the parents, with the, with the traffic effectively. And what you're looking to do is the most make more, traffic. Uh, make more traffic. It is the worst idea I've heard in my 20 years here. And it is so frustrating to see that there's zero data that's been presented. The accident that happened in 2018 happened at nighttime. I remember it, it was outside my house. You've shown my house several times on this presentation, which is lovely. Um, it is a horrible idea. I'm in fully support of Dinowitz's proposal to put in a, a signal. We've been advocating for that for years. We've been advocating for a speed hump, but apparently the DOT didn't want to do that. Navardo was great to work with two years ago when we changed the signage just to reduce some of the parking because we have a huge problem with the parents turning on to the street. I, I don't think Keith, I'm, I don't think you're aware of the traffic and what happens with the parents during the drop-off. It is not a 30-minute process. Three it, there's three different pickups. My wife has physically been threatened. It was written about in the Riverdale Press a couple of years ago by one of the parents for blocking our driveway. And this is a daily occurrence for 20 years. It is by far the worst idea I've heard out of, I, I can't imagine and, and let's be clear, the North Riverdale Merchant Association, th this was really spearheaded by an individual. There were two individuals, to the best of my understanding. One of them is no longer on the committee. And from my understanding, this is not a unanimous thing. It was a couple of people who have been pushing this agenda forward. And I spoke to the committee today, or at least some of the individuals. They do not support this. So the whole premise that this North Riverdale Merchant Association is for this is false. And I don't know if you've polled any of them recently. I don't feel like naming names on this call, but I'm very aware of who's trying to move this agenda forward. And, you know, listen, I think their agenda would be to make Riverdale Avenue completely green. I can also tell you in 20 years of living here, not once has a student ever biked to a school. I haven't seen a kindergartner or a fifth grader ever take their bike on Riverdale Avenue or Moshalu Avenue. There are no bikes outside my house. And I invite you to come any morning during school drop off to come and see what's actually going on here. I don't wanna hear about your data, which I think is false. Why don't you come here? I will meet you, I will take off from work and you and I can sit in my living room and watch the mess that is here. And this is only gonna create more of a problem. And by the way, there is also a crossing guard on okay. 256th Street. So this idea that it's gonna make it safer, you have a city paid employee 
monitoring traffic, helping people turn during the busiest hours of school. So the whole premise is false. Your data is false. And this is just a bad idea, no matter how you frame it. Okay, thank, thank you, Ron. That's what I got, sorry. No, 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 sorry no, 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 no. <laughs> um, Let's see, so it is 9.09. Um, so I, we, I think we need to start bringing this to a close. I'm going to go with maybe like four more people, but try to keep it to two minutes so we can kind of keep it under 10 minutes. Um, maybe we can get five people in, that would be great. Um, so uh, Ross, uh, Teo, you're next. Thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate it. I, I have to say, um, I, I don't believe that the premise um, and neither does transportation alternatives that Vision Zero is safe. In fact, um, 21 was the most deadliest year since 13. Um, secondly, um, as Damian McShane eloquently stated, the sole purpose is to slow and cause congestion, right? That's the road diet. They want to create congestion. And this is the whole, the sole purpose. So I feel that this community board, which has brought 150 people, which is a lot for an evening for everyone who has sat here, um, and kudos to this community for doing so. Um, it, it, you know, the problem that you want to create congestion, we need to ask the DOT to put a halt to their plans, to listen to the proposals of this community, and to vow to us that they're going to do that until we can come up with a plan that takes into consideration what's going on here on the ground. Your data doesn't do that. You guys have this, this goal to that there's congestion. Therefore, we have to like bring up data that shows what our congestion and our plan is. And then you have a circular argument that we therefore need a road diet. It is a one size fits all. And as other people have said, it's monetary. It's the easiest thing to do. And it's not going to work here. So please listen to every single person on this call telling you it's the wrong thing to do. And it needs to stop until we can come up with a proposal telling you what will work in this corridor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Teo. Uh, Michelle King or Kling. Hi, thank you. I just want to say that I 100% support Assemblyman Dinowitz's proposals, and I hope that the Community Board 8 will uh, review these and uh, advocate for them. I want to echo what other people are saying about the double parking uh, that's been going on in Riverdale Avenue ever since I moved here 30 years ago. And I urge Community Board 8 to support Ms. Salter's call for a moratorium on this plan until the community has had more opportunity to express its opinions and that we have reviewed alternatives. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle, um, next is Jeremy Jutkowski. Hi, yes. Uh, so my name is Jeremy Jutkowitz. Um, I'm sorry. New, uh, no, it's fine. Uh, okay. I'll try to make it brief. I'm newly the vice chair of the Main Street Alliance. Uh, as Damien mentioned, the Alliance has not taken a position on this proposal yet. So to be very clear, I'm speaking for myself as a resident of North Riverdale, uh, not on behalf of the organization. Um, I'm not a traffic scientist, but I do live in the community and I drive on Riverdale Avenue six days a week. Uh, I have several concerns about the plan. First is the section of Riverdale Avenue between 254th and 256. Um, pick up and drop off at PS81 frankly, can only be described as mayhem. Um, the idea that these drop-off cars could all fit onto 254th if the parents would just listen is unrealistic. There's double and sometimes triple parking up and down both sides of this two-block stretch. Um, it takes me longer to go those two blocks than it does to drive my kid the rest of the way to the century. Um, it's great to talk about what should happen, but we have to work around the realities of our unique community um, and, and the problems that we have. And to the DOT, frankly, if you're not familiar with the drop-off policy of our local schools, how can you call this a complete study? Um, I was shocked tonight to hear that you hadn't reached out to the school to discuss which streets they're dropping off on, where the cars are lining up, what times they're at, if it's staggered, if it's not. Um, this stuff matters. Um, next is the request for the traffic lights. This has been going on for at least 10 years that I can remember. Um, you know, getting them on to 250, 256 and 259. Both schools have requested them in the, in the community, SAR and PS81, as well as, you know, several other organizations. Um, 
it seems that, you know, this is something that's possible, but it's my understanding and I think the understanding of the community that the studies that were done to evaluate the feasibility of these lights was done in the summer in non-peak times um, and that a, an accurate portrayal of the, the street wasn't really done. Oh, uh, Jeremy, two minutes, two minute warning. I'm almost done. Um, and, you know, and lastly, I think we need to think about what would happen if we did a road diet uh, in terms of overflow traffic onto Liebeg, Tyndall, Fieldston, 259. Has a study been done to, you know, evaluate what's going to happen to these streets? They're, they're already dangerous. I have friends who live at Fieldston, 259. There's an accident there twice a month um, that they witness, at least. You know, so I, I think all of this needs to be looked at and studied. Um, unfortunately, it seems to me that this, this plan is really the least that the DOT can do to improve safety in our community. We need more than paint on the street. We need a, a comprehensive approach to traffic and safety, not just half measures. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. So it is now 9.15. Um, so unfortunately, um, we have one board member who I see who is um, on the call. So I'll, Lisa Dobb, uh, I'll have you go and then that'll be the end of the community discussion. And then we'll go back to the committee to kind of discuss resolutions um, and next steps. Thank um, you. I'll try to go fast. Um, just in case anyone was wondering, um, this, this is what 256th Street and Riverdale Avenue sounds like when the school is letting out. Uh, just one in case there was any doubt. So um, that's where I live. So I sort of know this area very well. It's a residential area with a short commercial overlay. We rely, we reside here. Um, it's relatively quiet, green, affordable, and easily accessible. We need our cars to go to Westchester, New Jersey, or the East Bronx. And we rely on our buses uh, to go into Manhattan or for the rail connections. But, you know, so first there's four points, congestion. We, it currently moves fairly smoothly uh, in the North Riverdale leg of our trip to the subway or Metro North or by express bus to Manhattan, but the reduced travel lanes uh, with 50% more traffic will certainly cause congestion and add time to our bus commutes. We're already, as said, we're down to two travel lanes in front of the school. So, who knows what will happen. It leads to more tension, driver tension, which leads to this honking and safety issues. So safety issues, as was discussed, um, 256th Street, it's the crossroads to the PS81, our library, neighborhood house, Marshallu Avenue, the Y, Netherland buildings, and the three Skyview Towers. So um, it's amazing that our uh, DOT has ignored our requests for the traffic light on 256 as well as 259th because it does take three traffic lights to uh, make the left turn and cars then rush to jump ahead of the oncoming traffic and uh, I mean there's near misses all the time uh, with pedestrians in the crosswalk. Um, it'll also increase the rush down the hill at 256th street to make the green light uh, as was said, it will be impossible for cars to get up the driveway, but um, it, it will make it a very dangerous situation with electric bikes and mopeds that don't stop for red lights, who often ride against traffic on sidewalk and don't yield to pedestrians. Two minutes, um, two minute warning. Two minutes, wow. Okay, uh, we're concerned that it's going to slow emergency vehicles especially going up to uh, 256th and 259th Street uh, intersections. As was said, maintenance alone, fix the potholes, do the striping. Um, that will um, really, really help. And I don't know why it took so long for us to get the countdown lights and audio crossings. Um, I will skip a lot about the neighborhood. Again, I'm concerned about cars veering off to the smaller streets on Fieldstead Road and Tyndall. Uh, it will make it more difficult and more dangerous. Apartment buildings, we're residential. I don't know how we'll be able to get deliveries, garbage pickup, uh, drop off passengers. We have lots of people getting meals on wheels and accessorize. So um, said, you're three minutes, so if you could okay. uh, summarize. I, I will forget the process, but I will uh, just want to say that for years, we've requested more efficient and effective methods to enhance safety. 
And there is no good safety reasons to narrow the entire avenue. It's detrimental to local residents, businesses, their customers. It will make our main street less safe for pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers. Listen to the insights of people who actually shop, worship, work here, attend school, and live here on Riverdale Avenue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So um, I want to come back to the committee. I'm sorry. Uh, one second, Deb. Someone yeah. who um, just texted me, Bob O'Brien. He was on the speakers list. He's yeah. been waiting. I don't know. Uh, Bob, are you there? He has I a particular him. point. I know. Your name was called. Bob, are you there? there? I don't yes, I, am. I apologize. I had to step away for a moment, take a call. I just want to make two brief comments. First of all, as a retired fire and life safety professional, New York City firefighter, um, we live in a densely populated neighborhood. I've lived here for 36 years. I'm a homeowner, been involved in the community in many aspects with uh, some of the members of this committee uh, on this um, screen tonight. I agree wholeheartedly with Assemblyman Dinowitz and the uh, speakers that presented uh, very, very good cases for this debacle. From a fire and life safety point of view, in the city, the New York City Fire Department has a three to five minute response time from the time the call hits the firehouse to the time the fire, firemen show up in front of your door. This will severely impact response time in this neighborhood. We have schools, Skyview, we have Netherland Gardens, Riverdale Gardens, and densely populated streets with very narrow streets. Cars have gotten bigger. Cars have become wider. There's a lot of truck traffic throughout the streets. This has to be rethought. If it's not, people will die. I apologize uh, for not responding earlier, but that's all I needed to say from a life safety point of view and somebody that's been there on the other side. So would the DOT like to respond to um, uh, how you've approached the fire safety and ambulance, and fires, trucks, and ambulances, fire, ambulance, kind of police, fire, this, ambulance? Yes. This, this so so the, pol the police and uh, all emergency vehicles. Emergency vehicles. No matter what anybody says. Bob, he's being, trying to answer you. He's trying to answer you. Just one sec. Uh, Keith, can you go? Yeah. So uh, as we've mentioned earlier, we, we have this treatment on many roadways, including adjacent to hospitals, uh, adjacent to firehouses, adjacent to police stations. Um, we have them on ambulance routes and the, the organization of the traffic allows for emergency vehicles to use the center painted median in, in the unlikely event of an emergency. They can use that center median along the entire corridor. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially like a giant fire lane along the entire strip from 263 to 246, sorry, two, 254. Okay. Great, thank, right. thank you, Keith. Thank you. Um, so I wanna just uh, pull the committee to back together. Um, and so, and to kind of sort out where we are. Um, one of the so it, it, things I've been hearing in terms of, of trends are that we, in, we are very much in agreement that uh, a turn signal. I heard a lot of folks say that they agreed with the assemblyman that a turn signal would be really important at those two intersections. Um, and that we also heard from DOT that these turn bays would help us get a turn signal. So I think that's something we need to think about. Um, the school safety issue, uh, the normal way to be to kind of pursue that would be with a school safety study to have DOT actually take a look at that since they have not done that already, if I'm correct, if I'm reading this correctly. And so- um, I just wanna be clear, I just wanna be clear. I was refer, I'm familiar with how the operation of the school drop off and pickup happens. Mm -hmm. I was referring to a, an agreement that the board was referring to that they had with the police department and the principal at the school re I related to something which I had never heard of. That's what exactly what I was talking about, just to be clear. Okay. Um, but I think that there's a, a kind of general agreement that the, the during that half hour of pickup and drop off, there's quite a bit of congestion um, on uh, Riverdale Avenue. And then um, I hear speed cameras making those 24 hours, which I think is something also the assemblyman mentioned, and then just generally red sur uh, resurfacing the roadway and uh, relining it, of course, which would happen regardless. Um, so uh, I want to open it up to the committee for comments on next steps. We could do a resolution that requested these things. We can uh, we can do a resolution that's opposed to certain aspects. Um, I haven't I haven't prepared anything right off the bat, so I want to see where we were. 
um, Ed or Mary Ellen or David? Well, uh, or Chris? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just say that I, I reject the uh, proposal completely. And I, I just wanted to thank some of the speakers, especially Ross Freeman for his honesty and Teo, some of the things. I, I, I don't believe Vision Zero. I believe Vision Zero makes things less safe, not more safe. And, and the bike lanes also, uh, you know, for pedestrians mainly, but I, I just don't see this improving. And that's a disclaimer, I am chair of public safety committee, Bronx Community Board 8, as well as the community uh, uh, committee member here. So um, I don't see how creating more congestion is gonna make things more safe. Um, and I think some of uh, Assemblyman Dinowitz's uh, suggestions are, are, you know, worth taking a look at. Definitely the left uh, left turn signal, and uh, I, you know, I also a lot of these proposals for bike lanes I think have been just you know tried to be pushed through by by activists for this type of stuff, and they really don't have any. Uh, you know, they really don't have any basis in public safety. They use public safety as a guise to push through these projects. And uh, they're, they're not really founded in public safety. They're gonna try to cherry pick some statistics that may or may not even be factual. And, and, and as somebody else mentioned also, uh, I think it was uh, our chair, Laura Walter, what other data is it being compared against? Okay, so you have in one certain area, you have a couple of, uh, um, accidents. Uh, um, so uh, compared to what? So we don't live in a world where everything is safe and you're going to have a completely safe environment everywhere you go. So where are you, con where are you comparing this data to? And comparatively, is it a not safe area? So I just think a, a lot of times these, these issues of uh, safety are being used as a guise to pass uh, agendas of activists for certain other things. And I think that's the case with this. And I think we need to stop it in our community. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad a lot of people came out. I see a lot of people didn't even get a chance to speak. And uh, I, did, I refrained from sharing earlier because I just wanted to hear what the community had to say, but I kind of had a good idea what, what uh, they were gonna come out in full force. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm settled on this. I will not support any uh, bike lanes, uh, especially in this particular area. And I urge the rest of our committee to reject this proposal uh, completely. That's it. Uh, Mary Ellen? Hi, um, I totally reject this proposal. Um, I think it's a big danger. I am totally on board with Assemblyman Dinowitz um, with the, the left turn lanes. I think that would make things smoother. Um, I think the bike lanes are, are like, just like an accident in the making people between um, people making deliveries and trucks and drop-offs and people parked. It's like, it's a total blind spot. They're not going to see this biker coming up. They're just going to want to pull out and bam, they're going to be hitting like, and like bike people on bikes are going to be like fair game. Um, there's too much traffic for, um, to, for, to narrow down those lanes. It's, it's too much traffic as it is the way, the way it is. So if you narrow it down, it's going to get much worse with the buses and everything juggling along. And, and also with PS81, another disaster, you have all these pickup and drop-offs. You think there's fights now, well, there's going to be more of any narrow it down. It's going to be totally crazy. Um, you're putting children in danger by all that because children are crossing at the same time with all this craziness going on. Um, it's, it, it's just an accident I'm making. And I, I further strongly say that DOT does not just go ahead with this. Like they just go ahead with everything else and just do it. Cause they did that to Palisade Avenue by putting in those, those big cement things on Palisade Avenue that made them get flooded at 2727. So pl I please hold off on doing what you're doing till the studies are done. And we have much more meetings about this. It's, it's very dangerous and I totally do not go along with it. I totally should think I shut it down. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mary Ellen. It, um, is there anybody else on the committee who wants to speak? Sure. Uh, David? Yeah, uh, you heard all my stuff at the beginning. Um, I think a, a good middle ground is a, a key thing that uh, the assemblyman was 
uh, talking about was getting the left turn signals. Um, and then the commissioner mentioned that the that that's been investigated on the four lane and that it could e rather easily be done on the three lane. I think that's a good way to address both sets of concerns. Yeah, so, I agree. I mean, the, the I, I'm sorry, Dave, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you want to finish? No, no, no the, all set, okay. thank you. Okay, so I'm, I, I, I'm gonna say for myself that um, I still stand by what I said at the beginning, that Vision Zero is a real thing. The transportation alternatives has um, been critical of the implementation of it in the city, saying that often it's not gone far enough. Um, we're not being cohesive enough or coherent enough. And certainly there hasn't been enough community involvement sometimes in educating about it. Um, but I do know just intuitively that if you only have one travel lane that you have to cross or one travel lane that you have to negotiate, it's easier to just make that turn. Um, I also just know intuitively that putting all the cars in one row just makes it easier for cars to follow each other. And so um, I will speak also just to the, 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 um, the congestion that, um, you know, looking at the numbers for um, Riverdale Avenue, I, I myself do not live in, in West uh, Riverdale, um, and, but I live on Sedgwick. Sedgwick has twice the amount of traffic volume as um, Riverdale Avenue and Sedgwick is itself only two lanes um, with uh, you know, uh, hills and curves and all sorts of things. And it doesn't come to a complete dead stop. So um, I, just, I just felt like it was important to say that. I do think that it's clearly the bike lane, the, we can take or leave. It's essentially just taking up, uh, it's amusing some extra space that's left over. The point here is really the turn lane um, and it seems to me, to David's point, that the turn lane, um, the turn signal is the thing that we all kind of agree on, and that the turn signal has been rejected in the past because there wasn't a place for the car to actually sit. That the, the, um, and so for those reasons, I do support the turn, the turn bay, because I think that it would get us, but only with a, also adding into the resolution a request for turn signals at those two intersections. So, I mean, Ed, would I know you've already you've said that you you don't want to support the plan at all would you be open to a kind of a compromise of supporting the center the those turn bays so that we can also request turn signals i wouldn't be uh, i'd be opposed to to this entire plan the only thing i'd be open to is some of the suggestions that uh dinowitz uh assemblyman dinowitz made about the uh the left turn signals and i'll also have to t i just have to add I couldn't couldn't let that go because I live on uh, I live right on Sedgwick Avenue and Sedgwick Avenue does come to a complete standstill. It's an it's an absolute nightmare uh, going down the hill and you know cars are stuck in intersections um, and this is mainly around school time. To be, to be fair, um, it's not all the time, but it, it's it's I, I've taken Uber to get off three blocks. Uh, 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 you know at, at uh, when you make the turn because it's so backed up. So that, that, that's absolutely um, not true that, that Cedric doesn't get backed up. So that, that probably is a, pre, a fair preview of what can happen over I, there. I do wanna actually interrupt for a minute though, Ed, to say that I think that's a, actually a perfect example because the part of Cedric that you're referring to is Cedric Avenue between Van Cortlandt Avenue West and Mashaloo where it's two lanes going in each direction and that the cars going around each other are getting in the way. There's a lot of interference. So you have backups and horns honking and everything. I'm referring to the part of Sedgwick that's only two lanes that goes from Van Cortland Avenue South all the way down to Kingsbridge Road. That part okay. of Sedgwick flows. Um, and so, yes, uh, Dan, please don't talk. Um, I'm sorry, I was trying to hear. It does not flow, um, Deb. It does not flow. It does it, not. It, I believe it flows. So like we can agree to disagree, but it certainly flows, uh, flows fine for me. So anyway, regardless, um, as far as re resolution goes. Um, the answer is no, I'm not willing to compromise. Okay. So do you have a resolution or? Um, my, yes, my resolution is we reject the uh, DOT's proposal. Do you want to call the vote for that? I can call the vote for that. Sounds good to me. Sure. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I second so the motion. Kelly seconds it. 
So all those in favor of, so I just want to make sure, is, is Isvali Jimenez on the call? Deb, why don't you drop all the hands so that only committee members oh, now yeah. can. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. That's a good call. Um, and is Vali on the call? No. Okay. And, uh, and then Georgia, are you still on the call? Yes, she is. Okay. She's got her hand up. She does? Yeah. George, did you have your hand up? George, would you like to speak? Okay. All right, so the, the resolution that Ed has put forward is to reject the um, uh, proposal as, um, as presented, just flat out? Correct. Uh, okay. All right, so all of those in favor? It's not clear whether George is in it or not. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm gonna- uh, In favor to reject? I don't think George is on the line. George is not responding. So I think her hand might just be stuck, but we still have quorum, so. Okay. Um, so all those in favor are Ed, Chris, Mary Ellen, Kelly, Mary Ellen, and then uh, I, uh, David, are you opposed? To this resolution, yes. Okay, I am opposed as well. So then it passes by a, on a split vote. Um, so I think that that's, that's it. I thought we could make that short and painless. So um, any other, so I guess we can move on to the next bit of business. I just wanna say thank you very much everybody for hearing us out. We appreciate your feedback. We're gonna leave you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you both okay. all, for, all, all for coming and staying for the whole thing. We really appreciate it. No problem. Good night. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a good, good night, everybody. Good night. So next we have a, a SAPO request. Uh, we received a request for a full street closure of Johnson Avenue from 235th to 236th Street mm -hmm. for a pop-up farmer's market. Uh, farmer's market organizers, I think, are here with us tonight. Um, I'm here. Here they are. You win MVP. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's all those vegetables and healthy living that you've got. You're able to stay up late. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let you present really quickly and tell us what your plan is. It's for May, May 22nd, and um, it's on uh, Johnson Avenue from West 235th to West 236th. Can so I you share? Can, you, can, can, like, I, can uh, I, you can share. I need, um, I need a little PowerPoint. Yeah. Try to keep it to like five minutes if possible. If that's oh, a fair the only request. way I can possibly follow that up is to be brief. So yeah. Just... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hold on. All right. Hang on. Sorry. I'm seeing your email. If that makes it. Oh, there it is. Okay. That's the highlight of the uh, of the presentation. Okay. And item start at the beginning. Okay. So it's about the street activity permit for May 22nd, 2022. For those who may not know, the Riverdale Wise Sunday Market was created in 2010 to provide the neighborhood with fresh local food. Since then, the market has also become a village square for the community. As of January, the market is now year round. The spring season starts this Sunday, April 3rd. Our usual hours of operation, which is very relevant to our request, are 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. with set up from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and breakdown between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. The market has been taking place in the parking lot of Riverdale Temple, West 246. 6th Street and Independence Avenue since May 2020. And Riverdale Temple, it should be said that Riverdale Temple has been a wonderful host. Why are we asking for this particular street activity permit? 
Riverdale Temple is having an event in their parking lot on May 22nd. Rather than closing for that day, we feel that it is an opportunity to bring the market to another part of Riverdale. What are the benefits? Our goal is to draw additional foot traffic to Johnson Avenue to benefit both market and storefronts. We already have a very loyal customer base that comes every week. We also hope to expose community members to local produce direct from the farms, vendors from other parts of the Bronx and sustainable products. A lot of people don't yet know about the market. We want to remedy that. Logistics. There will be between 20 and 25 vendors um, in terms of music. And I know that music is, uh, that for KRBC, that music is a big production. So for us, I mean, I haven't planned it yet, but it won't, retire, won't require electricity or a stage. And generally we have music between 11.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. So probably that it will be exactly the same. I made a diagram to show the layout. And I tried, the scale is, I just want to warn you, the scale is clearly not very accurate, um, but the measurements are. So there's the layout. So just, I mapped out the street enclosures um, and, and made sure the, I was talking, when I was talking to Tracy Shelton, she said that they always, Put their, um, put their fire lane down the middle of the street. So that's what I recorded here. Um, Google Maps says that it's 41.27 inches across. Um, so I marked out the, the lane and had the number of vendors. That's what those little squares, those odd little squares are. Um, and that music would be on the place that I, that I put for music would be the corner of um, the corner near Apple Bank. Um, so, so there's the plan. So now I'd like to throw it open to questions. All right, great. Could you um, stop sharing if that's possible, so I can see hands? And don't let anybody okay. tell you that's not a great drawing. That's a good drawing. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, Mary Ellen Gibbs, you have your, your hand up. Um, I would be totally in support of this. I'd like to see more of this, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have so much of this. Um, it brings community out. I mean, especially after the two years of nothing and people can meet and greet each other. You know, it's been too long that people have been isolated from each other. And it, it's a nice get together. We haven't had any kind of market or any kind of... Um, street festivities for a while and we used to have so much of it so i think this is a great idea and thank you for trying to bring it back so hopefully everybody will vote on it totally in support great thank thank you mary ellen uh david gelman uh yes uh two things one you said 41.27 inches i believe you meant 41 uh feet but anyway <laughs> thank you, <laughs> um, thank you. Um, uh, more, more seriously what if any well what if any criteria are there for uh, vendors to participate because that was an issue a couple of years ago. Okay. Not with you, but with somebody else who uh, tried to put on a street fair there. The criteria are the same that we usually have. So, um, I mean, so I have, I mean, right now I have between, right now I have between 25 and 30 vendors on my books. Um, they don't come every week. So, in terms of, um, you know what, if you don't mind, I actually wrote this out. So let me look it up so that I can give it to you the way that I actually wrote it out. So I'm not just fumbling. Hold on. <coughs> and actually, let me share that. Hold on. Sure. But be patient because I'm gonna actually have to find the page. Um, while she's looking for the page, I will add that um, uh, CARE-VC has um, expressed support um, for this plan, um, as has the, the city, our city councilman, Eric Benowitz's office. I don't think I see them on the, on the call. Um, I'm sorry. 
Um, also, uh, uh, Laura has texted me to let me know that Georgia was trying to vote. Um, she is opposed to the Riverdale Avenue plan. <clears throat> so I'm gonna add her to the um, resolution that we voted on uh, along with Chris Kelly and Mary Ellen. So. Well, the answer is that the categories are, because this, I mean, it's a farmer's market. So it's local farmers bringing food they grow themselves or meat and dairy products from animals raised by the farmer. Food products made locally in small batches, such as cheese, coffee, and pickles. Prepared food made fresh by the vendor. Um, and by the way, of the, of the prepared food, nobody, there's nobody who conflicts with any of the restaurants on the street. Crafts made and sold by the vendor, including jewelry and knitted items. Sustainable items that complement local products sold at the market. And services and products deemed to be of particular significance to Riverdale and the Bronx. So the example for that one is, is most notably Bronx bound books. Um, because they're, I mean, they're selling, she's selling retail basically, but she's doing all sorts of, but it's, it's a whole, it's a whole project. It's a whole enterprise that's super relevant to the Bronx and who we are. So those are the categories. Does that answer your question? Uh, partially, but it, immediately below that said, we are not accepting applications for the following. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry, Bath and Body, um, because I've already got two Bath and Body vendors. And the thing about having a small market, this is really important. The thing about having a small market is that I can't have a lot of one kind of vendor okay. because then we're competing. Mm -hmm. So I have two Bath and Body vendors and then the other one is baked goods because I have a lot of baked goods. All right, but those are the only criteria. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Sylvia Alexander? I'm just curious, being uh, that I live right there, um, we now have the restaurants on the street. Um, as it is, it's crowded uh, already. How are you going to set up? I, I see what you, uh, the plan that you have, and it looks fine if we didn't have the restaurants. But now that we do have the restaurants, how are you going to work around that? You mean the outdoor dining? Uh huh. You mean the, you, the actual enclosures, yes? Yeah, yeah, they're not gonna go away. Definitely oh, not. Yes. No, I just wanted to make sure. Um, so as I laid out on the diagram, um, I calculate, I've looked at them, I've measured them. Um, I calculate that I can fit in, um, I can fit in two, between Metate and Moonstar, and three between Moonstar and Blue Bay on that side. So that's five over there. And then looking at my own diagram. You mean on the sidewalk or in the street? In the street. And in addition to their uh, restaurant? Yes. And so I've the, talked to them. I've actually gone- will be in the center of the um, uh, street where you said would be the emergency lane. Uh, no, right? they'll be they'll be right up against the sidewalk. Can't be against the sidewalk. That's where the restaurant is. Well, hang on. Actually, I'm going to pull up my diagram again, Sylvia. Hold on. And hello, by the way. Hi. Because I actually, yeah, I've been been going around measuring, measuring and talking. All right. So if you look on the left hand side of the street, the the all of the all of the the enclosures are the ones that have the, the, like their boxes and they have measurements. Uh -huh. So that's where the that's where the the actual shelters are. So I mean, for there is a space. Like I said, this is not scale. There is a space between Palace of Japan and Starbucks that would be big enough for a vendor, which are 10 by 10 tents. But um, the woman at Palace of Japan said to me, she said, you don't wanna do that. She said, there's always this really disgusting puddle. She said, don't do that. Like, okay. So local knowledge is important. But between Capital One, I measured it, it's 25 feet between Mitate and Moonstar. That's enough for two. And then between Moonstar and Blue Bay, that's, I mean, when I was there, I didn't measure it, but there were two very large SUVs parked there. 
And so I'm guessing that that would be at least three tenths right there. Um, and then on the other side, it's just standard. Right, and because there won't be any parking, right. Um, and then it's 324, this is same thing, this is Google, 324.39 feet, lo feet long mm -hmm. divided by a 10 by 10 tent is 32. So take away, so my calculation is, um, my, my calculation is about 22. 22 10 foot spots. Is that, does that answer your question, Sylvia? It certainly uh, answers my question. Doesn't make me happy, but it, it answers my question. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, I don't see any other hands. So um, I wanted to just go back to the committee. Um, I would like to um, I move to, oh, Nick, you have a hand. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I was late on the hand. Good evening, everyone, again. I just wanted to let um, uh, folks know that I did speak to several of the merchants, not all of them, but I spoke with Neem, Neil at Neem, and Cecilio at Mitate, um, Eason from Palace of Japan. They were all very supportive. Oh, and, and Chi Tang from Manchis, who was really uh, supportive and uh, is is actually excited about it. The only thing they asked, uh, which we dealt with with uh, when we had open streets on Johnson, was that we just notify them. Which I know uh, Shira has already done rounds over on Johnson and talked to some of them. But whichever way the committee decides to vote and the board ultimately votes, just for staffing, because when we had the Johnson Avenue, they were really busy, which was a really good thing. Uh, during the during the open streets, um, so they they had to to have more staff ready for the extra business that uh, the foot traffic brought in. So, anyways, just wanted to report that and thank Shira for uh, engaging the merchants and getting their thoughts and ideas and opinions and taking them into consideration. That's very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I want to just bring it back to the committee. Um, I'd like to move um, for a resolution to support, um, to approve the, this um, proposal or this uh, permit, the SAPO request for the full street closure. Um, do I have a second? Yes, you do for me, Mary Ellen. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, a vote. Is there anybody opposed to the SAPO um, application for the uh, street closure of Johnson Avenue? I don't see anyone. Is there anybody abstaining? Um, so, and I guess I'll just, uh, is, and so therefore everybody is, uh, do I see a hand of who, who, who is in favor of? I'll just uh, do the last bit, which is a small group. In favor, you said? Yeah, who supports? I'll raise my hand. Um, uh, Georgia, do you support? Is Georgia still here? I think she's off. Okay, I lost Georgia. Okay, that's reason enough to do hands right there. All right, so I've got um, six four. David, uh, Ed, Chris, mm -hmm. Kelly, Mary Ellen. Okay. Hey, right. Deb, so it's, uh, I just wanted to say briefly, I just wanted to thank Nick for commenting on that because that actually had a lot to do with me supporting this because I just like to know that, you know, where the merchants stand on this. So thank you, Nick, for uh, for sharing that information. Yeah, right. I saw the same thing because it does bring, with all the foot traffic, it does bring more business to the merchants that are there already. Yeah, no, totally. Thank you, Nick. That was one the the only open question I had from um, from prepping for this. So I really appreciate that too. Well, I want to thank the um, I want to thank Ciara for reaching out to me with the questions about the vendors, because that's what made me go and talk to as many as I could. So that was thank you for the guidance. Oh, wonderful! I'm, I'm glad we were able to help <laughs> make this a better a better process. And thank you for all your hard work and good luck with the festival. Thanks for bringing it thank back. Thank you very very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the next thing on our agenda is um, the discussion of budget priorities for fiscal year 24. Um, Ed, do you need to leave or are you here? 
You don't have to go to work. No, right? I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm actually home sick, so I'm, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, excellent. Okay, good. Um, not I'm sick, but I'm here. <laughs> right? You're a trooper. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm hearing. Um, okay, so let me pull up. So why don't we start with capital? Um, I'm going to share my screen. I, so what I did was I, um, this is, this sheet is a little bit different. It's just because it's a lot easier for me to delete <clears throat> and move things around in Excel. Um, then where'd my Excel doc go? I had a feeling we'd be moving stuff around. So, um, right. So here we are with the capital priorities. Um, I only heard back from Ed as far as um, actual like uh, uh, order. And so, and, and Ed, or uh, you and I were mostly pretty, um, we were kind of aligned, I think. Um, so I guess what, what worked really well in the parks committee meeting in order to put things in order was to just kind of do a game of, um, of, uh, of head to head. So where we take, like, for example, the first one that's at the top right now is the feasibility study for stormwater management um, and have it go head to head with um, the one that's right below it. And then we'll slowly kind of, the ones that deserve to come up will start to work their way up. Um, I also had started to make some notes because I did meet with uh, DOT and oh, yeah, that's a folks who, oh, they've got wristbands, okay. Um, I met with DOT today, mm -hmm. and so um, just wanted to like so. So there's some things where we may or may want not want to rank them as high or whatever. So the first one is a feasibility study for stormwater management for the Deegan Bailey Avenue and Broadway. Mm -hmm. So um, the big question here was, um, for me at least, was is DOT the right agency? So it's definitely the right DEP and DOT together are the right people. Um, so this is a joint with environment and sanitation. Um, and so it, it's definitely, we're, we're barking up the right tree. So we want to keep it. Um, the next one down from it is uh, rehabilitating Van Cortland Park South Step Street from Van Cortland Park South to Gale Place, including integrating green infrastructure to capture stormwater and creating a pedestrian plaza at Bailey Avenue Park entrance. This would also be a joint parks kind of DOT thing. Um, I have to confirm, finish the final wording with Ramdot. Hey, Deb, um, can I ask you a quick question just to, just to back up to the first one for a second? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. You mentioned that you spoke with DOT today. Was there any conversation about who would provide the actual funding from that between the two agencies, or is it kind of, we don't know at this point? So basically, they said that the city funding was kind of, uh, th that it wasn't earmarked for just DOT or just parks or just DEP. Um, the, the, the thing they couldn't answer for me was that in the streets plan, stormwater management is one of their goals that they're accountable to finishing or to doing or will at least be measured against. And so they must have some budget or some mechanism that um, we can trigger to get um, stormwater management in our, in our district. And so what is that, you know? And so they'll, that, they'll get back to us on like specifically whether they will, it's, I think it'll essentially come down to, will they be the agency that responds to this budget priority come this summer or will DEP be the agency that primarily responds? But, but I think it's still, it's strong to have us both on the, on the, on the issue, you know? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So if we had to, um, and I'm just going to open it up so we can all talk about this, uh, you know, so, so we're, you don't have to wait for me to call on you. Um, do we want to put um, Van Cortland Park South Step Streets uh, and the rehabilitation of that? Is that more important than the feasibility study for the stormwater management? I'd say for myself, I feel like the, st the stormwater management is one of the most important things because um, it, it uh, impacts the whole district is to try to get more attention from um, from DEP. You know, after, after the flooding of the Deegan, I think stormwater management is a big, big priority. Read. Okay. Just lowering my hand. Um, and then the next one, so we'll keep that as number one. 
So then we've also got install lighting on Marble Hill Lane Step Street. Is that one, does anybody want to make a case for moving that one above um, Van Cortland Park South? Uh, Deb? Uh, yes, Chris. Uh, I sent you an email. I don't know if you got it. I did oh. uh, check that out and all oh, the lighting Oh, yeah, and you there said works. that there was a light. Yep. There's three lights and they all work. Really? Interesting. All right, then. Well, so then uh, I think we'll move that one down to uh, there's three lights there. They had 236 overpass is a big priority. That's really falling apart. So two, we'll move that one. So we'll do, I'm gonna do this, let me use this one for our, our priority. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna move them. Um, so this one, where was it? Here. Well, Are we to... saying that, that that doesn't need to be uh, addressed because it's already been addressed? The, uh, yeah. I think what that's what he's saying is that there's already light there. Okay. I'm going to delete it. Yes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so how about um, rehabilitate 229th Step Street from Kingsbridge Terrace to Sedgwick Avenue? So the oh, so I want to uh, one quick note about Step Street. So I asked DOT specifically about Step Streets, and it's basically going to be a two-step process. The um, step one, and if you look at our budget priorities from last year, their responses down here, um, that they put, please contact the borough commissioner's office to discuss this request kind of over and over and over again. So I asked them like, what, why, what's that about? And that it's a two-step process, um, pardon the pun. That, um, <laughs> that the first step is the office just needs to send to DOT the request to have it repaired. And then they're gonna see if they can do it within their regular um, budget, within regular maintenance budget, um, or whether it's capital. But so often what we hear when we I do ask for these repairs is that they say it's capital, that it needs to be rehabilitated um, and that it's on a list someplace if there's a schedule. Um, you'll see like this one, the rehabilitate Naples Terrace Step Street from Broadway to Godwin is actually on the 10 year plan. It is scheduled for fiscal year 31 at this point, um, but it's, it's on the 10 year plan. So it's something that needs to continue to be advocated for. But the step streets, I, I, I think the, my, my follow up item from that conversation with him was just to simply take all of our step streets that we want, keep them on the list, put them in the order we want them to be in, uh, but submit them all to uh, DOT to see if any of them might get fixed and they might get fixed, that'd be great, but most likely they'll end up, you know, living on this list. Mary Ellen, your hands up. 236th Street, the overpass is a big priority to me. It's really a lot of elderly people with their shopping carts go over and it's a disaster. Is it already on the list? It's the, is that the 235th? That's because 235th is like 235th, 236th, right? Right. Um, it's really good. bad. Where's that overpass? I'm like looking for it. I know it's on there. So, it's on you there. Have it on. Oh, here, here it is. So right now it's at five. Are you making yeah. a case to bring it up a little bit? Because it's, yeah, it, it's, it's really bad. I see there, there are a lot of elderly people that do cross over with their shopping carts and everything else. And mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have fell. <laughs> it's so, it's really bad. I mean, because it's also, it's been on the list, like last year we put Naples Terrace right above it. Um, because it's been on the list though before, I'm open to moving it up since some of the stuff above it's it. A big tra it's a big travel new. overpass. So uh, maybe, do we want to maybe put it above this step street? Yeah, please. Ed, Kelly, Chris? Does that make sense to you to move? Um, the pedestrian walkway up to here for now. What do you think? Who you maybe you guys don't cross it as I, much. I, well, I, I, well, a lot I've of people crossed, do. I've crossed that step street. I mean, I'm sorry, the overpass, and I'm fine with moving it up. But as far as the rehabilitation of the step streets, are any of them in dire need? This okay. is, it's bad. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the overpass. I'm talking about the step streets. 
I would say that of the step streets, probably 225th or 229th, this one mm -hmm. is, is the worst. Um, I, I'm familiar with that one. I know it's bad. And then actually there's a lot of flooding in that area too. Yeah. Like that's, okay. like I, I think we I, can, yeah. I, I'm okay with moving um, the overpass. Mm -hmm. Above it? Above above that. Okay. Let me find it. Uh, pedestrian walkway. All right. And then and this one is already in the plan. Oh, so I this one I think we want to have be in kind of in our top five, which is um, repaving Kingsbridge Road. As odd as it sounds, it's actually a capital project because it's a full depth concrete roadway for several blocks. And so when I, it, this got, this was surfaced when I re re requested resurfacing um, and I asked to get it paved and it's, um, what they was told it was, it had to be a capital project. So um, that one I would try to keep in the top five if possible. Like. I wondered about that when I saw that because I, I I wasn't sure, you know, if that just, I mean, we usually just request to pay the street. So I figured it was yeah. something a little more uh, uh, extensive than that when, when I saw that. So that's why I probably, I would have ranked it higher if I knew that, but I, I, I'm fine with moving that up. Well, would, I mean, then would anybody be open to ranking it like above this Van Cortlandt Park step street to put the, the, I just think paving is so important um, myself. Like I'm always happy to follow up on a paving request because it's like so essential to public safety in so many ways. Mary, well, your hand no, I wouldn't put well, it above that overpass that we just talked about because that that's a lot of elderly people have to go to the supermarket every day over that. Uh, and they're killing so, themselves over it. Who else, uh, was somebody else speaking? Kelly, was that you? No, it was me. It was you, David. Okay. Um, paving is important, but um, as we talked earlier, much earlier, um, the step streets are dangerous, and the ones that we're thinking of have some uh, neighborhood equity issues surrounding them. So I think we should look at them uh, pretty high. The, I mean, they're dangerous in their current state. And, 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 you know, your, your conversation with the commissioner is uh, well taken, but uh, we have to make sure that between those conversations that they get taken care of. Right. No, absolutely. I agree. More so than, than paving. As much as I drive my car and I've, I've already had two sets of wheels that I've had to get fixed because of potholes and it really sucks, but I still think that the, the safety of the step streets is more important. How would you feel about putting uh, the paving over a step street that's already on the 10 year plan? That we're just kind of, keep, we're keeping it on the list to continue to uh, exert pressure, but we're not trying to get it onto the 10 year plan at this point. It's a little bit more symbolic. Okay. What do other people think? I, I'd be fine with that. I agree with what David said also, everything else about the uh, step streets taking precedence. But but since we already have that one on the plan and it's scheduled to be done at some point, yeah, we can push it back. I would go along with that. Okay. So, So how many? So one, two, three, four, five, six. That's our top six. And then we've got um, the step street at West 231st Street. Um, and then making a step street, um, which I changed this to a study because that seemed like that was the first um, the first step in getting a step street. Oh, uh, Frederick, I see your hands up. What would you like to say? Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to derail the conversation, but I, I am going to log off soon. And I just wanted to give you a quick update on the, the bus issue that you emailed me about. I, I think you had wanted to talk about it tonight. Um, I did finally hear back from the MTA. I sent you an email, but I'm sure you haven't seen it. Basically, okay. they're not sure if, like, it sounds like DOT didn't put that pedestrian crossing sign in. So they're not sure who put that sign there, mm -hmm. which is what they were trying to figure out. So the bus driver had to move it because apparently it wasn't an approved sign and he couldn't make the turn. 
So I think they're still kind of looking into it, but that's their version. So if you hear anything else, or if anybody else hears anything else, please let us know so we can sort of keep that going. Okay. Okay. All right. Very Are we good. talking about Capuck and Johnson? Yeah. Sorry to completely go to left field, but I, I just wanted to <laughs> no, sure, that, that, share that information. I, I think I know what you're referring <laughs> yeah. to. I've driven by it. Yes. I thought it was so, a bizarre appearance. Yeah, I, I assumed it was part of the installation of the left turn delineators, but apparently DOT said they didn't put it there. So we have a rogue community member who believed that it was a good sign, but they put it in the way of the bus. So that's the MTA's version. Um, please let me know if you hear anything different. Okay? Well, I, I, I will tell you that our, uh, our rogue who uh, keeps on doing the half moon overlook uh, stuff lives right there. Well, we'll, we'll pick that conversation <laughs> up later, David. <laughs> you bet. You bet. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. All right. Good night. Thank you. Um, all right, moving on to see. We have the we have the West two. Yeah, can you can you uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, raise the uh, increase the font? We don't care about the right end of the uh, scale, but I it's nearly impossible to read this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's good. That's that's enough. All right. So no, no, good call out. All right, so um, we've got a feasibility study for stormwater management. We've got the Van Cortlandt Park Step Street. We've got the pedestrian walkway over Henry Hudson Parkway. We've got uh, the 229th Street Step Street, uh, resurfacing Kingsbridge Road, Naples Terrace, um, and then 231st. And then we have um, the what remains is a feasibility study for a Step Street. I'm just going to get rid of these two. Um, oh, so, um, sidewalk. Hey, Deb, how did, how did 231st get below the, uh, repaving the road? I, I thought we were, uh, Oh, I, we, we, we were talking about 229th and we were putting it, I mean, we can move 231st up. I'm sorry. I didn't do that. We, does anybody want to move 231st up above no, any of these? The step I think you're saying all three of them. The repaving, right? Right. All the step streets should go above the repaving. Oh, okay. Correct. That's what I say, too. Um, with the exception of the 10 year plan one. With the, right. With the exception of the, the Naples Terrace one. Okay. I got it. Um, that's this one. The, the other step streets we have the Bradley Terrace one. We may need to just look at these or, the order for these. Make sure mm -hmm. that. Um, all right. So I wanted. I do want to make a suggestion that this Goulden Avenue Dickinson Avenue connection can stay towards the bottom, um, just because it's not as vital as some of these other things that are more public safety oriented. Sounds Anybody good. else disagree with that? Nope. Um, no. Oh, I'm, I'm not even sure of what that entails, to be yeah. honest. Right. Oh, really? This this was a carryover. This was our number six from last year. Um, this is where Dickinson and and Goulden would get um, uh, connected. So that right now they're kind of a dog leg at Sedgwick, and mm -hmm. so this was the the proposal to um, make them into one uh, clear lane or one clear roadway, so you should just drive straight through. Are you having second thoughts about them? You know, may, maybe I have a short memory, but I, I just, I, I'm trying to envision it and I, I just can't visualize it. Maybe I forgot, I wasn't, didn't attend or wasn't had to leave early or something for that, but I just, um, I'm having, I, I guess let's, let's keep it moving at this point. I mean, yeah. I don't feel like it's such a big priority this, this time it, around. It, but agreed. I don't think it's a priority and I, and that intersection, it has been staggered like that for many, 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 for decades. Um, I, I, it's not a new I, traffic I, pattern. It's not that I'm questioning the priority of it. I'm questioning whether it's a good idea, period, but that's period, for- Right, yeah. right. Okay. So I'm just gonna remove it, I guess. And I'll just let the ENS know. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, DEP owns it. And I think the idea was basically convincing DEP to pay for it. No. No? I, don't, I think it was just the idea was just that um, it was going to require both DOT. DEP was going to have to agree to it because there's a bunch of reservoir stuff. 
Um, I mean, the Croton runs under Dickinson, and then there's all this equipment in that island. That I didn't know that. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that's that's why it was so difficult to get it paved. It's okay. because it's DEP property. Um, all right, let me go back up here. Oh, okay, thank you. That was my question. <laughs> right, so we actually can forget, like center ourselves. Um, all right, so we've got the two. So I think this means that we're at the top of the step streets. So what about the feasibility study for a new step street? I feel like the paving is maybe more important than a new step street. Yeah, and, and I, I, are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, I was uh, just over there last weekend. I, I mean, it seems like a nice to have, but not a necessary it, to it's have. exactly what I was going to say. It's a nice to have. I think it's, it's vertically probably only 20 feet. It's a, yeah. it's a path that could be made nicer. Uh, it is not a transportation point. Whereas the other step streets are, are pretty much thoroughfares. Right. And do we want to deprioritize it or do we want to remove it? I mean, I would, I would lower it. Because, deprioritize yeah. it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there are some vested interests in it staying alive. Staying. Okay, that makes sense. Um, all right, so we've got the reconstruction of sidewalk on the east side of Independence Ave between 240th and 242nd. Um, so the sidewalk construction is a, is a thorny issue in that it um, is a responsibility of the homeowner. Um, on this particular stretch, it's a park, kind of. It's, a, it's an yeah. unbuilt street. Um, and then a kind of a, a, an informal garden has come up in the kind of the roadway. Um, but that the, that the, the sidewalk piece um, would, it, it would, there would definitely be like a, something a little bit more complicated and we might want to um, like have more community buy-in for it is what I would suggest. Um, Mary Ellen, your hand is up. Ooh, um, sorry, it's from before. Oh, okay. Actually, I'm realizing this note is actually for a different one. I re removed, we had a, from a previously a, um, Sidewalk on the north side of 235th between Independence and Van Cor uh, and Henry Hudson Parkway, and that one the the property owner is aware of it. So that one we don't need to. That's that's not a capital thing. Uh, do we want to keep this? I I got a question, Deb, about that. Um, yeah. Again, my memory fails me a little bit on this, but as you mentioned, that that's something that I would not be comfortable about including unless we had some type of discussion with, I mean, you don't want to put the onus on uh, property owners to pay for something that they didn't sign up for. And I don't okay. recall what we discussed um, with the community at all with that. So without, without, again, if you, unless you can refresh my memory and say, we did have some type of conversation with that, I wouldn't be comfortable with putting that in if, if, um, if it was going to have to be picked up by the uh, the expense would have to be picked up at some level by the uh, by by the neighbors. Yeah, I mean the only thing I worry about with this is the, the expense would if there's a any private property owners along this area, they would have to pay for the sidewalk, and so um, you need substantial buy-in for it. I think this is mostly park, but I don't think we've delineated it necessarily enough to say okay. It, we only want sidewalk from here to here, or that DOT might just go ahead and put in more sidewalk that might be missing that where there would be an expense. I mean, was this idea brought up by one of the one of the residents or it was? Well, when we were doing that Independence Avenue thing um, last last year, um, this was this piece of sidewalk came up as um, something that's missing. You know, when you're walking on the east side of Independence Avenue, the sidewalk disappears for a little bit. Um, particularly because it's an unbuilt street, so it didn't get sidewalk built um, whenever they built the sidewalk. And was there consensus for that, for that to be done at the time, or were we not sure? I, I know that, I think, you know, consensus is a funny thing. I think everybody agreed to do it without knowing what the, what the cost would be or who would be having to pay them. Gotcha. That it was, you know, I think that that was the, um, in, in the call, it was kind of, uh, consensus that it would be good, but that we didn't really get into the details, I think, enough that I feel 100% comfortable with it. Uh, David, what's your 
thought. You got your hand well, up. Well, <laughs> actually, in both locations, uh, I think they're uh, fronted on uh, apartment buildings. Um, and they are areas where there's quite a bit of pedestrian traffic. Um, and it's city law that you have to uh, uh, maintain a sidewalk and a curb uh, at the street uh, from your property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not just a new burden out of nowhere. It's been city law probably for 75 years. Right. I mean, if it's the, if the sidewalk is in front of city it, it, um, a home, though, it wouldn't be a capital project in that case, I guess, because it would be paid for by the homeowners. Right. right. In this case, in these two cases, they are apartment buildings. So then this is probably not a capital request in the first place, because it's it's just really like if if we choose as a committee to do a resolution or a letter or if somebody in the public simply submits a request to DOT to say the sidewalk is missing. I mean, you're right that they're, everybody is required to have sidewalk. It's just that DOT doesn't pursue if they don't have complaints. That's a fair point. You, you may want to have Kira investigate it, but that may be the better avenue. Yeah. So should I, it sounds like, it seems like I should remove this as a capital priority and then um, we can see if we want to follow up with it as a committee. I would drop it to the bottom. Leave it there because we're not going to actually decide till next month. Mm -hmm. um, and just check with have Kira check into the the issue in the interim. If there if something remains, we'll deal with it. If there's nothing to be dealt with, we can drop it next month. Okay. You know, you know, I just want to mention one thing. The only thing I'm a little confused about with this is that if what David is saying is true, that that about the city law, that and and at the same time the residents would have to foot the bill that that almost it doesn't kind of go you know if is that the case i mean how, can they can it it's city law yet yet they can essentially just uh charge the residents to have something done because it's city law it seems some doesn't seem right mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly because that's what's happening at palisade and kapok those folks need to replace the, you know, they've got the curb that's too low because the street has come up. They've got to replace their sidewalk to make it higher. And the, the DOT is asking them to repay for, to pay for the whole thing or that they will yeah, go that was to the building. That was one thing I talked about. I said, that's oh. ridiculous. Oh my God, I got so mad at that. So that's just how it works for everybody. I mean, even yeah, all, they, all of our buildings, we have to pay for the- They changed, they changed it. They, it worked for years. They changed it. So they should have to pay for it. Well, that's another worst one color, but- is is that a co-op or is i mean because if it's a residential building that's not a co-op that would be the landlord fitting uh for the co-op it's the pro property owner's responsibility the property owner's on responsibility. independence avenue or anywhere i mean i'm sorry right. like all all co-ops anywhere I mean, it, well, they, i'm just referring to that to independence yeah. avenue you know what if it needs to be done maybe we should just leave it as a low priority on the list they may just pick it and do it anyway and if it's something that that can't be avoided in terms of the uh, residents picking up the cost and that's the law, then it, it, it should be done, and it, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, we'll make it a low one for now and we'll investigate it a little bit further, I guess. Good right. idea. And then, so these two, the decorative park style street lights. So this was an interesting conversation today. So um, DOT, we'd already asked DOT to look into there being inadequate light on the sidewalk. Um, because of uh, safety, um, they uh, did a study, but th or they looked into it, and um, they only a they only um, care about uh, street light, ambient light on the street, whether it's adequate for driving. They don't care about the pedestrians in that way, and <clears throat> um, so they didn't they didn't they they weren't able to give us any actual information about pedestrians. They just rejected putting additional lights on the street. Um, I asked today specifically about the pedestrian area around over the sidewalk and they said that we could um, request um, an additional arm be uh, go off of the existing lights um, to go over the sidewalk. However, um, it's um, not funding that would come from DOT and it's not a project that DOT would do because they don't, their um, requirements are entirely about the street, not about the sidewalk. 
And that even if we did put it on our budget priority and we could get like an assemblyman to use discretionary funds or something like that to pay for it, you still need a bid or some sort of standing entity to pay for the electricity. So he said that it's only in areas where there is an existing bid where they will have like a park style light, unless the parks department themselves decides that they want to add lights to an area. So, um, I mean, I think it's something we can, I, we can maybe kick over to the parks committee. I don't know. Um, we should certainly combine them, but, but as far as for our priorities, um, it's not really a, a DOT thing, this request, if that makes sense. All right. So where does where does that leave us? That uh, I I personally have a vested interest in this because it's you know as chair of public safety, I think it's important to have well lit areas, especially around the reservoir, because there are a lot of car break ins, um, shattered windows and and radios being taken and all kinds of stuff over there. Um, so that from a public safety perspective, I think it's important. Uh, perhaps it's not in the correct committee. Um, we're definitely get a, a public safety committee is definitely going to have this as a budget request. If we're not going to do a joint with TNT, then I, I guess it would be the parks as you're suggesting, right? Why don't we? What maybe it makes sense to try to do some kind of three-way of like the the public safety should take the lead on it so that it's you know clear that it's a public safety thing that we're asking for, That's and then. Uh, you know, and then it's park land. So if the parks department decided they wanted to, I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, it's parks land if the DEP maintains. So I think that we would, at least along Goulden, that that's very clearly parks land and that doesn't have any um, park lighting. Yeah, it, it seems like a bit of a stretch to me to try to request funding from NYPD for this. I mean, hey, we'll do it, but it just seems like a bit of a stretch to me. So I think parks, would be the appropriate agency to request lights for. Okay. So, so we'll, it seems like we should move it off of our list because it's not, DOT will, <laughs> will install it, but they'll install it completely based on whether parks told them to install it or not, you know? Okay, so, so it's, DOT is gonna be doing the installing, but not the funding. It's not, yeah, it's like DOT is just a contractor on it because they already install, um, they, they do lights in parks. Um, but primarily, although I know that it's like the lights inside of Fort Independence Park, the parks department did, but that the lights um, along reservoir, the DOT did. Like that the parks department had to submit a request for the lights inside the park that were like in Washington's walk or whatever, like those, lights were all turning off. Um, okay, so, so the, the, simple question, jurisdictional. the simple question should be, are they, we're not gonna request anything from DOT as far as this is concerned, right? Right. Okay. So we'll move from this list and then try to, I, I guess this is the question, should we keep it on our list as like a joint thing? But we're, if, if, even if we're not asking, cause like, it, it, does it go on your list when you're not asking the, the police department, and we're not asking DOT. It's just the parks department is. It would be a. It's the parks department. I think we have to ask. Right. I mean, unless I. I don't think NYPD is going to be. Uh, not for lights. Yeah. So I think this is a parks issue, to be honest. <laughs> but does it mean it comes off of our list completely? Probably right because we're it's not our agency. I'm thinking. I think yeah. it should come off our list. Yeah, I agree. I don't think public safety is required to ask of only NYPD. I no, no, not at all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, we can we can request from any anywhere that's uh, you know relevant for public safety. Um, but I, I I just feel that this is uh, since well I mean I guess it's a public safety parks issue and we're gonna we're going to uh, request it from parks the money from parks and then DOT will install it if we ever get it done. Okay, so I'll put it on Round Dot's radar. That uh, to, I'm on the Parks Committee, so I can raise it. But the, it sounds like it's a joint with Public Safety and Parks, and not with DOT. 
If you can raise that, great. I've actually reached out to all the other committee chairs for their approval for, for joint requests, but I didn't have that on my radar, so I will also send them an email uh, tomorrow. Okay. I'll just put it at the bottom just so I don't lose it. And when you speak to him, show him how to do cut and paste of rows. He could learn a lot from you. <laughs> all right. So where are we at? So we got Godwin to, we got the feasibility for the step street. So this one, we were just gonna move down, right? So, so I see, so we're down in the down parts. Um, all right, so upgrade storm water catchment on Broadway bridge to prevent water, rain, rain water runoff from the roadbed to the Harlem river. So this one, they said the Broadway bridge capital improvements are already underway. And um, they suggested that it seemed to suggest that there were going to be a lot of changes happening on the Broadway bridge anyway. And so they'll, they're going to come back to us with their plan of what they're going to be doing, but that um, this one, it might fix itself based on all of the other work. I mean, they're doing extensive work on the Broadway bridge. So this one might already be a thing they're fixing. Don't know. Deb, quick question about that. So, so I, I was a little confused about that too. So the, the, the rain water runoff, you want to prevent the rain runner, <laughs> the tongue twister, prevent the rain, the rain water runoff from, <laughs> from the Harlem River. So you want to prevent the water from going into the water? Is that, is that what we're talking about here? That, I, that I seems think like what we'd want to do. I think the idea was that we wanted to send the, the rainwater runoff into the ground so that it would filter a little bit before it went into the river. Yeah, well, Why? That, that doesn't make sense because no. the bridge is all gr grates. So it doesn't, <clears throat> it's not like it collects a lot of um, uh, chemicals from the asphalt because there is no asphalt. That's a fair point. I mean, it does. There's a. There's certainly some stuff from the water uh, from the cars, but I, I think that's that's. Good. I would get that out of here. Uh, it's a very good question to ask, but from uh, TNT and ENS to uh, of the uh, the agency that's going to rebuild uh, and reha uh, rehabilitate that bridge, to ask them those questions. But I don't right. think it's a budget request. Right, we'll just recover this part of our conversation when they present their plan of what they're going to do with Broadway Bridge. That, Excellent. That's something Excellent. We, that I'd need an explanation because the simplest explanation to me is you're preventing water from running off into water. So unless anybody can clarify that, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a good idea if that's what the-, the Me neither. It would flood everything else. Okay. Right. All right, we'll move it. Um... Next, uh, reconstruct the street and sidewalk. Oh, so this is the one where the property owner has been put, is already aware of the, of the issue, which is 235th between Independence Ave and Henry Hudson. So we don't need, to, that's not a capital thing. I'm gonna delete it. Everybody okay with that? Uh, which? So 235th between Independence Ave and Henry Hudson Parkway. There's no sidewalk on the north side of the street. Um, there's a huge co-op there. Um, that uh, is responsible DOT for building put, the sidewalk. Put the the uh, property owner on notice. It's done, as far as we're concerned. Yeah. No, it did. Excuse me. Can I say something? You have come full circle on this issue. Full okay. circle. This is where we started easily ten or twelve years ago. DOT had a discussion with that property owner. Okay, and it's either city does it or the property owner does the property owner isn't going to do the work it would have to be the city that does it the city pays for it and then bills the owner we we've been through this and it... this was this was on our list and what the letter we got the same day we got the letter for 235th street we got the letter for 254th they were parallel 254th all the way down to put the sidewalk and dot said you have to put this on your capital list. We're not going to do it, right? Put it on your capital list. The, the co-op isn't going to do it. It has to go on your capital list. This should not come off the list. So Rosemary, the other thing I think you should be aware of for sure is that DOT said that if they build out the street, that they will build it out to its full width, that they will not just install a sidewalk, but they will do a full um, complete street. 
I'm, I'm completely unaware of that. Um, and I would like to have, I would like to know more about that issue. The, uh, it is clear where, where the sidewalk goes. It is clear where the flooding is. They already have the, uh, uh, the fire hydrant is in, the place where the street lights are in. It is to deal with that side of the street should be done. It should be done. It, but it's not I, a capital, I, I but it, it, it doesn't, according to Keith, it's not a capital item because they would bill it back to the homeowner. Of course, and they'll bill it back to the, that was always known. That was always no, no, but my God, this is like 10, 12 years ago. Of course, they're going to bill if they're going to bill yeah, it to the, to the owner. You're responsible for your sidewalk. You right, have so to build your sidewalk. If the city does it, they're going to bill you or you have the opportunity. You can do it yourself. The city's specifications. Those are your two choices. It was always known that the co-op would have to pay for it. Always. Yeah, but, but we are requesting things here for a city agency to do something on our behalf. Now, if, if what you say is true, we need clarity from DOT saying, yep, uh, we are going to uh, uh, do it and, and build, build the uh, property owner, which would- They said that 10 years ago, David. Okay, Rosemary, Rosemary. But with today, are... right now, that, so I think what DOT is saying to us is that this is not a capital thing if the board or the community, or the committee wants to put together a resolution or a letter to send to DOT to say, we want this sidewalk built, then they will, um, they will build it, they'll, but they'll build it back to the, the co-op. Oh, this so, is, I am telling you, Deb, so you I am begging that, you. We did that letter already. That was already done. The so answer Rosemary, we got you, back from DOT was put in on your capital budget list. That's what DOT told us to do. So I, I understand you. So can what we need is we just need to, like if the commit, committee wants to proceed with um, telling DOT to, 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 that we want that sidewalk, we can do that. Um, but we should probably do a vote of it or something so that there's a record of the, the request. There are, there are votes. This is years ago. You want to do a new vote? That's fine. We've been through this, a whole series of letters back and forth. And the last letter is DOT saying, if you want this street done, make a capital budget request. Exactly the same thing as 254th Street. If you want 254th Street done, put it on your capital budget list. Okay. The letters okay, came out the same day, same well, issue. Uh, Rosemary, th this is... Uh, what you're talking about is at least three commissioners and yeah. four committee chairs ago. You may very well be right. I, I believe that I believe you when you say it, but yeah. we, we just need the current people to to tell us, yep, that's what we're going to do. So I think that we should have Kira find that well, letter. We'll follow up. Yeah, right. Yeah, so we'll follow up, uh, Rosemary. This is, and, and let me say about 254th Street, they're not going to build that to the full width. You understand? I, so, I, so this is the way DOT gets out of things. They throw a poison pill into a proposal. That's what they do. 254th Street is not going to be built to its full width. Okay? Yet, they're going to do the sidewalk, and they're going to build bill all of those property owners for that sidewalk. It's the exact well, same thing here. As well they should. They're, they, they do not have to do a full street. They're not doing on 254th. They're gonna build a property. They're gonna do the work and build a property on us. The exact same thing with 254th. This is as not- As well not they should. All right, I'm gonna stop. I'm just gonna stop you just, I, I appreciate it, Rosemary. So we'll just follow up and we'll confirm that it's, uh, that Good idea. It, it, whether Work it can just tomorrow. proceed or not. Yeah, because if it can just proceed, it can just proceed. Thanks. Um, Right, so uh, so this is where we are right now. Um, we've got the um, the Deegan feasibility study is number one. We have Van Cortland Park South, um, Dickinson Step Street, and just connecting the um, the park. Um, I just want to make it a little bit clear to capture stormwater and create a pedestal. That we're really the goal is just to. Um, is to connect the the sidewalk to um, to the park. 
Does that make sense? Is anybody opposed to that? Connecting Bailey Avenue to the park. Any objections? Okay. Nope. And then rehabilitate pedestrian walkway over the Henry Hudson Parkway is number three. Rehabilitate West 229 Step Street from Kingsbridge Terrace is number four. Rehabilitate uh, Step Street at West 231st Street is number five. Bradley Terrace Step Street is number six. Um, resurfacing Kingsbridge Road is seven. Um, Naples Terrace is eight. And then the feasibility study for a step street is number nine. I thought, Deb, I thought I read somewhere about the step street on 232nd between Riverdale, from Riverdale to Irwin. I don't see that. Um, see if it was an old one. Kelly, have you been on it lately? I don't recall it being bad. Um, I almost took a header down there, so it's bad. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, all yeah. of these stuff streets, oh, forget it. Some yeah. of them are really nice. Just test your luck. <laughs> I was just on a really nice one up by um, up by uh, um, uh, Fieldston Road um, wow. last weekend. So, this is Step Street living up there. I'd be shocked. <laughs> um, so where, um, so, uh, Kelly, did you have an idea? Of what, what, I thought what I had seen in some of the material that was distributed for TNT that there was a discussion at the last meeting um, Step Street from 232. Yeah, no, no, I don't. Irwin and Riverdale. I don't mean that part. I mean, in terms of the order of things. I don't remember, even see it on this list. That's no, I was going to add it. Um, I was just uh, where where should I add it in? I guess because I think you're right. That it sounds familiar, but I'll I'll add it in and then I can just double check. Go back and double check notes. It's two. It's which one? It's two. It's two three two. Riverdale to Irwin, River to, between Riverdale and Irwin. Riverdale to Irwin. Okay. So, uh, where do we want to rank it? Do we have a? Anybody have any sense of how bad it is? I'll mm -hmm. put it. I'll put it above put it. Naples, above the Kingsbridge Road for the moment. Sure, that's fine. Uh, Didn't we say earlier all the Step Street rehabilitations were going to go above Kingsbridge? Or am I wrong on that? No, I think you're right. It was all yep. of them. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Isn't this one, all yep. of them, this one's going above Kingsbridge too, except for Naples Terrace. I see was... the Naples Terrace one was below it. Right, that was the one we were going to put below it because it's already on the list. Okay. All right, yes. Ah, uh, yes, okay. Yep. Um, two, two, three, two, two, three, two, from Riverdale to Irwin. All right. So is this is this our order for now? We can finalize it for sure. The seven, the eight gives us a nice even ten. Yep. Sounds good. All right. And then stop the share and go find my expense. With my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting a lot done. Five o'clock in the morning comes around real quick. We, yeah, no, right? We'll start to drink it um, if we get past 11. Uh, Deb, do you think that we can combine several of these step, step streets for two reasons? One, they are similar, and it would impress upon people how concerned we are about step streets. Um, and, they, and, and it would uh, shrink the number of requests that we are making from this one committee relative to the whole board. Um, let me, um, why don't we put in a request to DOT to have them inspect the step streets and see if they start to break off 
on for our expense budget, we did that. I just worry that they only ever pick up one at a time. And so I don't know if they would pick up five. Well, if they do what you say to inspect them all, that that wouldn't that would be good. Yeah, that's true. Um, but if we combine, I mean, what do, what do other people think about just combining all the step treats into one budget item? Did I lose Ed? I feel like I might, might not get done. Ed. No, I'm, still, I'm still here. Ed, you're an old hand at this. What do you think about adding in all the step streets together into one thing? I just worry that it's, I might forget. Well, like, it, the only, you know, off the top of my head, the only thing is, are there certain step streets that are more run down than yeah. others that really well, that, are in need of uh, focus? Because if we're just going to throw five on the wall and see, hey, maybe they'll take this one, then then we're kind of losing the right. head of which ones are priority. Yeah, that's a fair point. I don't know if there, that's the case, though. So it is, are there any uh, ones that are really in desperate need? Yeah, the, the, the one that I mentioned is really bad. Yeah, well, in 229th, I think, is really bad. Um, and then the one that runs along Van Cortland at a Park is pretty bad. Um, so let's leave it as it is now, and let's move on to expense, and we can look at it with fresh eyes right. next month. Let's, let's move on. Good. Um, when I'm falling asleep. <laughs> I've got, you know, exciting expense items here for you. It'll wake you right up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, just, just sorry, they'll circle back for one second about that last thing. Perhaps it would be good to keep them together just when they're, when this stuff is all going to our full board, you mm -hmm. know, you don't want to break this up into a gazillion items. Um, Cause then, you know, it, it, what are we going to have different step streets on different orders of, uh, uh, on different layers of our overall board budget. If they're all together, they're all together, and maybe that'll give it even more higher priority on our on our uh, our board prioritization list. If they're all together, as opposed to one one or the other. So actually, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe they are better off together. I don't okay. Know. <clears throat> okay. We'll, we'll I'll make a note of it, and we can just return to it at the next meeting when we're fresh. Um, sure. Um, and so, so this one, I added a bunch of new ones after we met. Are there any of these that people just want to strike? I mean, uh, full disclosure, I just went to the, the manual the DOT has for expense items to see what there were suggestions. Um, so what, so things to, that we can strike, funding for workforce development for green infrastructure maintenance and uh, DOT does not do its own green structure maintenance. It's all done by DEP and they're hiring. So that one's easy. Um, let's see. I, I, yeah. I was looking at the one, the last one that you had on the list you sent out, upgrade stormwater catchment at uh, the subway stations um, to prevent rainwater runoff into mm -hmm. the roadway um i don't again i don't remember that really being discussed too much i know it was moved from the capital list but you know we we want to prevent you know we we want to prevent flooding in our streets but as somebody who works on the trains and with the trains we don't want to have flooding in our subway systems either so i don't i don't know what if that's been thought out uh to any degree I mean, we it, we could do a study, request a study for upgrade, um, for you know just catching the water better. Right, because the last storm proved that that I mean people were swimming into the trains and stuff. Well, right. these I mean, are the, the these above ground trains. Elevated platforms, but still, there's not. I mean, I'm familiar with those areas. There's not much. There's nowhere really for water to go other than down to the street. It's an unfortunate situation unless you're going to set up some type of catch basins there, and then what do you do with the water afterwards? Just let it sit there or remove it. So I that I don't know what the solution is to that. Um, I, I and there's a lot we talk about un, un, unintended consequences. I, I hate to you know do some type of upgrade, whatever that means, and find out it's causing our uh, our subway platforms to collapse or something. Well, I'm sure nobody would actually do anything that would cause the subway uh, platforms to collapse, but not intentionally. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> These days, I, I, you I never do know. Trust engineers a little bit more. 
Um, they, so they, the, all right. So I, I mean, I, there was a couple of, the only reason I hesitate is there were a couple of people who specifically spoke to this um, because it was causing some, the directly below it, um, erosion in the, in the, in the bed. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so that the street was kept falling, breaking apart. And I think really all it is is connecting and maybe we just need to change it. So it's like connecting the runoff, the storm water runoff um, from these stations directly into the sewer. So that's not hitting the roadway. It's just going, because it's a, it seems like it's a pipe and it's just uh, pouring out. The water is yeah, pouring out it. and hitting the street, that, right? That sounds it fine. And, and I am familiar with some of that stuff. And, and, and I know the gutters in there are either clogged or have broken uh, links to where that may be causing the problem. So that that sounds fair enough. Is that like a maintenance item? What I'm hearing is that like maybe it's actually just a request to this New York City Transit to clean their gutters. It could be a maintenance. I, I would I would think it would be a maintenance uh, issue. It does sound like a maintenance issue. Right. Oh man, you're gonna make me spell maintenance at this hour. Maintenance. Okay, kind of. All right, we'll follow we'll up. Put it on, on the that. spelling bee list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, so what else we got? Um, expand community outreach, outreach education on the Fair Fairs program. Um, I don't, that's, it's kind of a, I don't know if that's a high priority one. We've got repaving the protected bike lane along Broadway. That actually was already done. They did that. Um, oops. Uh, they just did that. Um, upgrading the pedestrian plaza at Manhattan College Parkway and Broadway. This one, I asked them about that, and they said that we would need um, a bid um, or a, a business to agree to uh, clean up the trash. Um, if there was any kind of anything other than just sidewalk. So Talk that to seems Nick like about talking with Catherine Bonard of the, the Kingsbridge bid. So does it make it though, does it remove it from here and then it just becomes something that they request if they've got a person who wants to care for it? I think that, that it, it's not necessarily appropriate here until it's got real partners and. Correct. And, and maybe. <laughs> If Nick convinces uh, uh, Catherine to take on that responsibility, he can request it. Right, exactly. Um, we've got our crossing guards. I know the crossing, so wait, so repair railings and, re and the up, up, up on Godwin Terrace. I think this is just a maintenance issue. Um, so I don't think it necessarily needs to be here. Anybody objects? What about the repair railings? Because that sounds, you know, important. It, they should definitely do it. Um, I'm just gonna. What did that gray out? Oh, because I was I was saving it. I was just changing the name. Ah, so that okay. was all the original stuff. Um, uh, Ed, what were you saying about the railings? Well, I mean, repairing railings sounds important. You, you mentioned that it's a maintenance issue. Who, who's, okay. who's the, who's maintaining it? The DOT or who is any? Well, it needs to be done. If the, if the, if the railings are not uh, sturdy and people could get hurt, they're broken. Yeah, I, it, it feels like it's more than maintenance. It's another one where we need to ask them to go inspect it and then see if they fix it or if they tell us it's an expense item or a capital item. My, yeah, I would think it would be expense, but hey, who knows? I do too. I mean, these two are the, are, um, this one's uh, the railings. You know, this, this one you'll know, Ed, this is at 238 between Orloff and Cannon where the, you know, the railings are rusted and have gaps in, in them. And then the cobblestones get completely overgrown with weeds. And it really just needs like sand or gravel or something put in to cover, fill in those spaces. And Deb, the same could be said for the step street at 238 between Irwin and Waldo. As a matter of fact, there's um, pieces of the pavement missing around the manhole um, cover for that leading to that step street. It's a uh, 238 between Irwin and Waldo, you said? And Waldo. Mm -hmm. That's true. Those two step streets are totally in similar. 
<sighs> All right. Part of that was caused by that scaffolding that was up there for years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and we've got, we've combined a bunch of these that were kind of more minor, just where it was just reseeding, repainting and reseeding. Yeah, but I think we passed over one. We passed over the crossing guards. So the crossing guards, it seems like, I'm going to say it needs to be moved up. And could you, yeah, could you add public safety? Because I, I, I texted you about that earlier. We, we're going to be part of that joint request also. Oh, okay. And then do I change it to a different agency too, also NYPD? Or is uh, it still DOE? Yeah. It's, you have it there. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. Um, okay. So do you, I was going to suggest moving the crossing guards up. Like what, like that seems to me one of our most important things that's been on the list for a long time that we just need better funding for. Yeah. Sounds good to me. And then I added this feasibility study for design of pedestrian and bicycle connections to Putnam Greenway um, at, a, at the request of, of uh, Bob Panuzzi because, you know, the Putnam Greenway has to connect to the sidewalk um, at wherever, like there's probably going to be like three connections um, uh, at locations to be determined. I asked um, about, like, I asked Keith if you know, this was appropriate as a study for them. And it sounded like it, it was, but they haven't actually been planning for it yet. Um, but that it was a way to actually, you know, get them moving on how to connect these, um, these two components, the, the going from the greenway to the sidewalk. But it could also be, it ends up that it really is just a, primarily a DEP thing and DEP will figure out how to get the connections to the sidewalk. Long story short, it hadn't really, it wasn't a, on his radar quite yet. <sighs> so I'm going to move this up. Um, it was number five, number one. Anybody have anything they would like to raise as a, a real strong number two? No, but I want to get back to the previous uh, discussion of the crossing guards. Yeah. Sorry, because uh, I had to go look this up. This is the response that we got. We just got a month ago for fiscal 23. Um, uh, based on the latest budget, the NYPD has a specific budgeted headcount. The agency is working on filling vacancies in order to get to that headcount. Okay. It's, so they that have sort of budget, says to me- They're saying they have budget already, they just can't get higher people fast enough. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I think they know that we want as, you know, all these different uh, crossing guards. You know, we kind of have the same issue with the school safety agents, too. I, I believe it's a salary issue in a lot of these uh, cases that they're having trouble filling the positions because they're just not offering competitive salaries. But um, we can keep asking. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're going to do these things. Uh, with priority in mind too, in, in terms of neighborhoods and data and, but this area is just a, a mess over here by PS95 and, and uh, Sedgwick and Van Cortland. So, so they need to get some, an, an extra person over here. So what do folks think about this as an order? I'm actually kind of okay with it. Where, I mean, you have, um, You've got the, the crossing guards, and then you have this one step street um, with the, it's got a damage bench um, that's missing its seat. It's got steps that are actually out of alignment, so it's unsafe. And then we have a feasibility study for the Putnam, and then we have a parking study for the Broadway corridor to understand future capital or expense priorities. And then we've got really just step street maintenance for four priorities. And then we have to decide if we want to keep the um, fair fares program outreach, which it seems to me that's kind of the potentially the least important that, that maybe it's already fully funded. I feel like I don't have full visibility on what exactly they're doing or whether they really need funding. And, and, and that's actually going to be citywide. Yeah. Um, we real, there's nothing for us really to request in our district on that. 
Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that out then. I, Deb, I don't know what anybody else from the committee feels. I, I actually had to conduct a parking study as my number one because parking has become such a huge issue. And a lot of times it's what ultimately derails some of these proposals by DOT because so many of them propose to eliminate parking. Um, I really think we need to find alternatives for parking, especially if DOT is going to go ahead and just unilaterally do things against the community's uh, wishes and start taking away parking spaces. So I, I just, I don't know how anybody else feels about that, but just to conduct a parking study of the Broadway corridor, you know, to understand what we need in terms of, you know, pro po possibly even commercial parking. Um, I think it's important. I, I, I almost dread to find to, to see what they're going to come up with, but you, you hope they come up with something that that, you know, helps the community, uh, you know, and people with cars have more parking for themselves. But I don't know. I, I, I had it as my number one. Um, but I mean, um, I support that because I think that uh, it would be really helpful to just know a lot more about who needs parking and who like like truck parking versus private cars versus people maybe driving in and taking the subway or maybe just uh, driving into work or driving into shop especially when we start to think about congestion pricing and tolls and all of that it, like if the we may end up seeing impacts just because we're at the end of the subway um uh, you know i'm actually confused by that question I mean, basically, um, from two, you know, from the Broadway Bridge to the uh, 242 subway stop at Manhattan College Parkway, mm -hmm. it's almost completely metered parking. Mm -hmm. There's almost no, there's no, uh, except for in front of uh, Marble Hill uh, east of the of Broadway. Um, there's basically no uh, regular parking uh, and there's almost no, um, you know, uh, loading zone parking. So I'm not sure what the question is that we're asking. Well, I mean, the question is maybe there should be some loading zone parking. Maybe there should be, uh, I mean, the, the, there's a, I mean, I don't know. There's all of the, the there's a lot of parking lots um, without any of it being public parking necessarily. It's public parking for those people who are shopping at those stores. People um, are looking for permanent parking spots. They're not looking for metered parking. Um, when shopping, it's fine for shopping, but the, it, it's a very residential area besides it being a, you know, a shopping area. And people, um, the, the main complaint is people don't have any better parking. They're circling the blocks for hours trying to find parking at all hours of the night. But, well, but, and they're also double parking in front, like on 231st, and they're double parking all over the place. You can hardly drive through. But the, that's an enforcement issue. But, but uh, are, are you suggesting that we might say that in that commercial corridor between 218 and 242, that we might suggest uh, removing uh, metered parking and uh, putting in uh, alternate side of the street parking? I'm saying that I don't think we're suggesting anything. I think we're saying we don't have enough information that we know that there's a problem, but we don't know enough about it. Yeah, that that might actually hurt merchants because then you'd have people who leave their cars all, there all day. I, that's exactly my point. Right. I would I would uh, ask the question uh, of Nick first before pursuing uh, uh, such a thing. I, I I I can't imagine a real need for it for exactly the reason that Ed mentions what no i i understand what he's saying i i'm, I'm not I, i'm talking about even, even if it's a putting in parking lots people need places where they can permanently park their car shopping areas are another thing you don't want to hurt the merchant you don't want to hurt people trying to park to, that are just want to run in a store for 20 minutes you know and people parking their cars there that's I have no problem with that. We, we want metered parking for that purpose, but we also need parking for people to park their vehicles um, so they're not, you know, overnight. Overnight, correct. Yeah. So we we well, so we we would want the city to buy a property so that uh, individuals could uh, have a 
reasonable place to uh, park their um, their vehicles for the month. Uh, I can't imagine the city ever going for that, uh, particularly when uh, you know <laughs> they want to build affordable housing. I can't imagine that ever getting on anybody's radar. I'm, I'm not sure that's a, a good uh, use of uh, our capital requests. And, and of course, we're not expense, yet talking so. about uh, doing a capital project, but I'm not sure it's worth asking the question. Uh, I, I just think the parking is one of, we make so many decisions based on parking. We give up things based on like uh, impacts to parking and that there's a, yep. just a lot Understood. we don't. And that the DOT is clearly like looking at the Broadway corridor. There's stuff that will come um, from them. And so it would be helpful to kind of, I mean, there's all kinds of, of weird strips of property along the, um, what will become the, the, the Greenway. Um, are there opportunities over there for parking or for parking garages or, you know, municipal parking? We're, I don't know. We're, not, we're, we're asking them to do a study. We're not asking them to build a multi-level garage. If that's what comes out of the, this question somewhere down the road, then so be it, you know, but right now we're just asking them to take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. Can I suggest we move it to the bottom? I don't think it's more important than anything else that we're talking about. <sighs> I don't. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. it wor it's worthy going to the bottom. Like I think it's a more important priority than that. And particularly if you send it to the bottom, that's kind of like it's not going to happen at all. I mean, really, the top five are the the biggest focus. We should have the things that we care about the most in the top five. Is it more important than re repairing the 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 railings on step streets? Oh God. Yes. <laughs> I mean. I can, we combine yeah. the, can we combine the, the, the step streets? Well, I, I mean, I, we should, uh, we've got a bunch that are combined there in the middle. I mean, I think the, the really with these step streets, we need to just, we need to request the maintenance thing. It might just be moved. Fair enough. That's fair. Um, I mean, I'm just going to here. I'm just going to put them together. This isn't suggesting an order, but these are all the step streets, I think, right? Yeah. And then we've just got two studies, and then we have the, the crossing guards. So if we can, I think we've been fairly unified in wanting to prioritize all the step streets in the same priority, essentially. So, like, what, what about? I, I feel like the parking study should be in the in the top. Five. Oh. I agree. I definitely do not. Sorry. But if we combine the step streets, wouldn't that put the parking in the top five? Because there are three step streets there. Mm -hmm. There's these. Just, um. just a reminder. This goes along with the five or 10 or 15 from each of the other 10 committees. Yeah. And then we have to whittle them all down to a total of 30 each, 30 capital, 30 expense. And then the borough president is going to look past the first five. I think, though, that the parking study might be popular with the board as well, David. Really? Potentially, yeah. I mean, parking is something that everybody has an interest in. I mean, and not everybody can afford a spot. And not everybody can afford a spot. Yep, um, I'm paying two sixty, and not everybody can. Um, so I'll, I'm going to make a note about combining the step streets and also just submitting them and see which ones fall off the list. And talk to Nick about the uh, the parking study idea. Okay. Ed, by the way, I sent you an email. All right, okay. and I'll talk to Nick. <laughs> and then what about the study for the pedestrian connections? Does this go above parking or below parking? Below. I'm sorry, which one is that? This is a couple of years out. Oh, there, there, so, there you are. Yeah. 
above parking, Whoa. below parking, below parking. It wow. goes below parking. And then um, what about the step streets? I, I think I would put the step streets above that feasibility study. Correct. For the, for the Putnam Greenway. Yes. Okay. It's less pressing, that's for sure. I think they'll figure it out. Okay. All right. So is this our rough order right now? We've got a couple of things to follow up on. Ooh. Essentially have four things. Yeah. Looks okay. good. That my only thing was and 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 I think it was David who said it was a good point too. Like when this ultimately all gets broken down um, before the full board, um, a lot of these things might fall by the wayside. So do we really want to have like uh, some of these things broken up, the, like the repair ra railings and repaint? Um, well, I mean, some of these things are very different. Maybe it would be hard to combine them all together, but I'm just thinking if, if you know, we don't want to bombard them with too many requests and have a lot of them just basically tossed aside where we could probably get them all on if we can combine them. But again, some of these things are, you know, have different elements to it. So I don't know if they can, they, they may have to stand alone. I don't know what you think. Yeah. Well, I think, I feel like we should see which ones we can get to fall off, just have them do through regular maintenance. And then um, maybe it's also just, I mean, these with railings and misaligned stone steps that just all needs to get fixed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like this one, like the repairing the, the lamp posts and the railings is it's just very different than the cobblestones here to your point ed yeah i i, I guess this this is kind of like cheating but is there any way we can lobby these agencies in the in the off season so to speak to get these things done if they're like minor repairs for them that's what i think that's why i feel like it's like there's got to be a way to just try to get it just get them to just paint it and right. then paint it fix it so okay so it's after 11 so i'm going to stop um, Ed, that can be surprisingly effective. Yeah, just, why not? Let's give it a shot. Yeah. So oh um, I think the only thing that's left, is there any um, old business? Oh, wait, before we do minutes. old business, minutes. Um, so Kelly, you had sent me um, some notes. I just wanted to, I wasn't quite sure how to, I, I didn't entirely have time and I didn't entirely understand. So I thought I would just bring it up here um february minutes what was your change that you needed me to make kelly are you there uh oh did yes, I lose? i'm muted i'm muted sorry <laughs> I, it's okay i just I'm figured you'd to the bathroom <laughs> <Can you hear me? laughs> i'm enjoying my brownie so yes um, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, what do you got in those brownies? <laughs> chocolate. You'll just never tell. Chocolate. That's it. Do <laughs> share. No problem. I'll send you some. Um, the section where we discussed the Bailey corridor. Yeah. Okay. So I was confused in reading that. <laughs> the heading itself. It says discussion on the. Safety oh, of intersections of Van Okay, yeah, right. So just but the, we, we the, just discussed uh, 238. 238 right? Street, right. Okay. So that heading needs to be changed. Yep. Uh, and okay. then at okay. in the first sentence. Towards okay. the end, mm -hmm. it says the November committee in oh, uh -huh. read meeting raised during the November committee meeting. Oh, good catch. Okay. And then, since we are only talking about the intersection of 238 and Bailey, there are only two bus lines there the three and the 10. They cross each other. 
Um, where is that? Um, the second sentence. Several, several, it says, it is a busy lines. intersection. It should be, it. it should be changed to two. Yep. Oh. And those were all my changes for that section. Okay, great. And then under new business. Mm -hmm. um, where it says, if anyone knows of other blocks that need to be repaved, the chair urges, instead of saying you. Oh, yeah, them. To become, change that to be community members. Okay. And that's it. That's it. Wonderful. Great changes. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, anybody opposed? I, I move we oppose them. I move we oppose. I move we approve the minutes of, Fe of uh, February 17th. I second it. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye, aye, aye. Raise two hands. Aye. aye. All right, we're the, the unanimously approved. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. The, the minutes are unanimously approved. Um, any old business? Any new business? I just thought I'd mention the neighborhood. Forget about it, Chris. Business. Forget about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of water. <laughs> I've been out of no, order for a long time. <laughs> no, please come, come back, Chris. Come back. It was just the joke was there, and I just had to take. Now it. I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, no, I just thought I'd mention the neighborhood got a, a new pedestrian crossing signal yesterday. Where? At two thirty second and Broadway, right by IHOP, now has a traffic light. Really? Does? That's awesome. Wow. I was there today. Second and Broadway. That's actually, that sounds pretty good, actually. Let's say I work too much. I don't see any of this. I It'll probably be more backup on Broadway, but at least people will be able to cross the street. Yeah, that's crazy yeah. over there. Cool. Okay, let's go check it out. Well, thank you for the heads up on that. I have nothing else. Well, thank you, you Chris. You, you've ended the meeting <laughs> on a high note. Um, all right, I, uh, I make a motion to, do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. So, Say good night, Gracie. All righty then. We managed to finish before midnight. So, <laughs> good night, all. Thank we're you. We're the midnight oil. Yeah, it was a good meeting, though. I think we got a lot done. So, Ed, get back to me on that email. It's important. <laughs> okay, I'll go check my email inbox. Thank you. All right. <laughs> good night, all of you. Good night, good night everybody. everybody. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Ellen. Yeah.